I'm going to call this meeting in order. Oops. <laughs> I don't have an agenda in front of me, but Barry. <laughs> Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Um, as you know, um, the week before last, almost two weeks ago, you declared the first state of emergency regarding the coronavirus uh, epidemic. Another week, uh, as we saw from that first week, we saw beach parties, we saw a number of large gatherings where the public simply, in, large, in, in many areas, were not taking the crisis that we face seriously. So approximately a week ago, you made the hard decision to close our beaches. You did that to try to protect public health, to eliminate those large gatherings and, and keep the spread from occurring. Well, since that time, we, they've moved from the beach and we had parties out on you know, uh, sandbars. We've seen large uh, bookstores that are still packed and not closed. We've seen a number of cases where um, the public simply isn't heeding the warning that we need to social distance to stop the spread. Many people in our community, however, are taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. Many people are doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to find a balance of trying to have a public message to say, take this seriously, or having governmental intervention to force us to protect the rest of the population who wants to stop the spread. Our health professionals are pleading with us that if we don't act now, it will be too late. And Dr. Cho is going to talk about that. The residents of Pinellas County and, to, and the Tampa Bay area need to take this seriously. We need to do everything we can to stop the spread. And that in, a, includes large congregations of the public where we're intermixing and this virus can take hold and spread to your neighbors, to your friends, to your family. We don't want to be like New York. Um, but as Governor Como said, it, if, if we don't take additional actions, we're going to be like them in, in the next two to three weeks. So today we're asking for three actions. One, we're asking you to extend the um, emergency order for an additional week. We're asking you to consider a resolution that would say to stay safer, that you're safer at home. You're safer at home is a message we're trying to have permeate our society to say we need to take more aggressive actions to, to keep us safe. The resolution tries to find a balance between safety and the economic impact. And I'll, and I'll be honest, we played with the language forever, and I appreciate the hundreds upon hundreds of ideas and thoughts, you know, but it's an impossible um, task. I mean, to set and say that you're going to close somebody's businesses, you're going to put their, you know, the, the employees, you know, out of a job, um, it, it, there's no good choice here. Um, but if we don't to take more aggressive measures, we know what's going to occur. Um, so we tried to find a balance in saying that this resolution it finds a common sense approach that says that we need to take reasonable we need to take reasonable measures, but we need to take reasonable risk. So under this, there's a you know there is a risk um, because we also know that there are essential businesses such as a grocery store. If we go to the grocery store, there is a risk there that we can contract this by people that we don't know that are coming in there. So under this resolution, it says that if you are not an essential business, you need to close. But it also provides that if you can employ social distancing practices in your business, then you can remain open. So we're putting the burden to take for people to do the right thing and take aggressive measures that are different than what we have today. Somewhat stronger language, and I think some people are going to speak to that. Um, they fear that if we don't have that stronger language and take that aggressive action, people simply won't act. I have that same fear. I do. And, but we're trying to balance that, you know, with um, knowing that a lot of people are trying to do the right thing. But I want to, you know, make it very clear that 
people need to heed the warning or, or we will shut you down, okay? If you do not employ these practices, we have no choice but to take more aggressive actions to, to keep our residents safe. We also say, you know, we, like I said, we have many people that have done the right thing and we're trying to find that right balance. Frankly, I didn't want to shut down playgrounds. I figured, you know, you have three kids at home under 10 and, and, and we're gonna have, <laughs> we're gonna ask you to stay at home. A playground is a great outlet. But as we saw pictures this weekend of 30 kids up on playground equipment because everybody's off, you, we simply can't protect the public health by doing that. That was the last thing I wanted to do. And we, and we were cleaning the equipment hourly, <laughs> but it's not enough. And so we have to take more aggressive actions. Um, so the resolution that you have before you um, tries to provide that balance. The whole goal is again, to stop the spread and remind people that you're safer at home. I'm asking for the rest, the rest of our residents to take this seriously. Um, and so we're happy to um, entertain any questions, have discussion. Can I, before we do that about the resolution, can we go ahead and do the extension so we don't forget to do that again? That, we that was, that was uh, Jules' um, <laughs> <laughs> request is that before we get yeah. into a, the discussion, we extend the emergency order for seven days. That would be from um, Friday to the following Friday. I would make that motion. Second. Okay, we, um, we have a motion from Commissioner Welch, second from Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, thank you. All right, um, go ahead. Thank you, and Barry, again, thank you to you and your team and all of our partners. Uh, I know y'all have been working 24 seven on this. Um, so you gave us an updated uh, ordinance today the essential infrastructure and essential governmental function section that was just moved is it still the same exact wording it, it's the same wording they, okay. they condensed a lot of the wording down um, they also provide uh, clarification um, in, in certain areas like we said you know pools they said public pools publicly available pools okay. things like that so there's some clarification language regarding that what would be the duration of this so long as the as our um, emergency is in effect, we can lift that. But again, we'll since we're meeting weekly because we can only extend it for a week at a time. We didn't we didn't put a duration, but we certainly um, will, it would be with the emergency order. But again, if we're seeing things different, we can have that discussion and lift that at any time. Okay, uh, had a question. I know we had exemptions for food production with the school uh, and, and independent food. Uh, distribution initiatives be exempt. For example, uh, Chairman Renee Flowers has a uh, distribution at Lakewood tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Is that exempt? Yes. There there's something about here. There's a provision service. in here regarding um, the school food programs, mm -hmm. and I'm, I've got plenty of staff that <laughs> are behind me that that can answer that. But yes, we have exemptions in there to where they can. Okay. Any any of the what we're trying to provide is that any of the food production areas even. For like takeout and things like that, they continue to operate, but they, they need to employ the social distancing practices. And and uh, for that, for the school programs, they want to keep the feeding programs going. The same way with nonprofits and others, um, that they that they can continue to operate under those. Okay. One other question, Madam Chair: yes, uh, Are we addressing houses of worship at all? No. Um, it that is exempt in here um, we played back and forth with that and and so we went silent on it the reality is they need to employ these practices um, but it, it is silent um, okay. and we went back on that a church or state is a le legal issue i don't know for me it's a public health and safety issue our church has, has, has employed those practices it's online the reality is if you put you know 300 people in, in a small space that, that's not heeding the, the, the significant issue that we're facing, and we need to employ different practices. But we, we, we keep that silent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, again, I also wanted to echo the, uh, the appreciation I'm, I have for our, our emergency group, um, our staff, um, our health department, um, all of the folks who are working extremely hard in overtime under emotionally stressful situations. I mean, this is nothing like we've prepared for. 
And yeah. um, as I try to tell people, we're doing the best we can. We're trying to minimize the mistakes. And if we make them, we don't try to make them a second time. But again, uh, first of all, so I wanted to say thank you. Um, we've talked a little bit about setting up a system, whatever that system is. And we've got 35, 36 of those little areas defined as businesses that can remain operational keeping while keeping all of those uh -huh. federal, state, local mandates about separation and all of that. I think that's important. Have we given thought to, um, at the end of the day, we're going to have to see how the numbers start to come out daily, right? We Daily, uh -huh. weekly kind of thing. So right. do we have in place in a thought, thoughtful way how we ratchet up or how we start to ratchet down based on the numbers that we have. Um, this is clearly a worldwide thing, but what's right. going on in Italy is not what's going on in yeah. New Mexico or what's going on here. What's going on in New York is catastrophic, and they should be getting the bulk of the supplies right now. They're making up two-thirds of the cases. Uh, if we were the epicenter, we would want that as well. Um, so. We're, we have our own story here. Uh, we have our own um, situation here that we need to deal with. So my, my, I guess my question is, do we have, have we given thought to those kind of metrics that we need to see to ratchet up, ratchet down in between the meetings that we have? Um, do we have a miscellaneous category that will cover things that you haven't thought of? For instance, I got a call this morning from somebody that said they are a supplier of product to an end product that is being used in the emergency testing. And I said, well, under, under paragraph 17, it says businesses that primarily supply other essential business and operations stated in this emergency order with the support or supplies necessary to operate, as long as it doesn't include a lot of the public. So right. um, there will be situations that have fallen between the cracks. Sure. Um, and I don't know if there's an outlet in here for you to exercise. Um, I think there's reasonable judgment that we can make. Um, you know, we're not going to be going in and looking at a supply distribution center in terms of looking at the product and what they're distributing. That there's no way for us right. to physically do that. Um, and and there were there's just thousands of different examples in businesses. What you know, if they laid off 20% of their workers, is that good enough? Or 80% of their workers, and now they only got six people. You know, it. We really are going to have to work on asking people to do the right thing, businesses to do the yeah. right thing, um, to where we can try to do that. But it's almost impossible to get into those. Well, we situations. have people out there that are, are letting us know when they see things that are out of line. I'm right. sure the employees of those companies, if they're not being treated fairly or safely. They'll let us know as well. Yeah. But ultimately, it's going to come down to the numbers that we right. see uh, that are happening here in Pinellas County. So we, I want to make sure that yeah. we're giving some thought to what that means and how that translates to our actions. So I, I welcome Dr. Cho to come up and talk about, you know, talk about <laughs> yeah. the health you know, aspect of this. We, as you know, we, um, we talk daily, usually many times per day. Um, and, and so we are looking at those numbers. We're not seeing those. But he, he will also tell you that because we're not seeing those doesn't mean that's not going to come. We also know that we're doing far less testing than anywhere else in the country. And so therefore, is that a false positive? Um, don't get comfortable. We're trying to take the right balance in that. But you, you, off, you authorized me as your county administrator um, del uh, authority to be able to act. So, you know, if there's something that spikes and we need to act, we can. Um, and so we, we have that in place. We have that, you know, daily conversation. Um, and, you know, you guys are just a phone call away. So it's, um, we could easily move quickly if we need we to do, to. take additional steps. Yeah, I'd like to, I, I just have one comment about that. Um, we have heard from a number of employees of employers who haven't done anything yeah. yet, and they're scared. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was a place for us to direct those, I don't know if it's the sheriff or it's you or, or what, but, okay, you know, that people who have 100 employees and everybody's still coming to work in one room. Let us let so, us think about how to do that. We'll get you back um, a, a script okay. to where how to how to address that situation rather than try to do it on the fly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And and if you want to hear from Dr. Cho, um, he's certainly available. Please. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cho. Good 
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Cho. Hope you're getting some rest. <laughs> Wagon. Okay. Do you want me to give the whole presentation? Yeah, yeah sure. Talk, talk about uh, kind of the, where we're at okay, and, sure. wh and what's occurring, and, and more importantly, where you see this growing. Fair enough. Okay. Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. So, obviously, we're we are, uh, this is unprecedented, right? The likes of which we haven't seen since the 1918 pandemic. Um, I know there's concerns, our numbers continue to grow, uh, both nationally and locally. Uh, there is also an increase in death um, nationally as well. Um, I do need to mention that glimmer of light that I'm seeing through this. Uh, never have I seen community partners getting together and working so hard, uh, governmental, hospitals, EMS, uh, or the, the private sector, really working hard to, to uh, handle and, and address this threat. Uh, never have I seen com the community and neighbors come together to offer their, their time, their, their bodies, uh, their equipment. Uh, uh, so that is the one little glimmer I'm seeing right now. Now in terms of other numbers, uh, they continue to grow here in Pinellas County as it is nationally. Um, uh, as of yesterday, we had 45 cases, uh, and if you look back, uh, just a week ago, we were we only had four. So that does continue to grow. Uh, we unfortunately did have a death, uh, one death that was reported yesterday in a 67-year-old gentleman. Uh, and I, uh, it's on, it's on our webpage, so please continue to look at the DOH webpage. We uh, update those kind of data by, by daily. Uh, so a little bit about the demographics in Pinellas County. Those uh, of the 45 cases. Uh, the age, age range anywhere from 21 to 83, uh, and there has been through this, of those 40, 45 cases, 14 did require hospitalization at some point. Uh, so testing, uh, we are continuing to test uh, at our DOH sites. Uh, what we are continuing to do is uh, prioritizing using the CDC criteria. Um, Baycare and other uh, hospitals are, are continuing to increase uh, their testing capabilities. Uh, we have private labs now that are, are testing more than I've seen la since last week uh, with Quest and LabCorp sending more and more of the lab out, um, lab out, labs out. Uh, and uh, we're working with EMS to make sure that they have also the capabilities to do the testing as, as the healthcare workers are EMS are one of those priorities. We have to test them to make sure they get back. Uh, they're in the front lines and they need to get back uh, and really treat those people in the hospitals and on the field. Um, so we need to also continue to focus on our vulnerable population. Uh, I know the young can develop severe disease, but as uh, the information, the data still points to that the older uh, in, uh, population, those with chronic health conditions, are the ones more severely in impacted. Uh, so we will continue to focus on that, and I appreciate all the work uh, and all the, the leadership at the Tallahassee level through ACA and DOH, uh, trying to ensure a nursing home and ALF have those uh, parameters, those uh, safeguards in place. Um, and put the graph. We see it. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Go okay, yeah. very good. So this is sort of a, a graphical uh, presentation as to what our numbers are doing. Uh, the line graph in the red is the Florida numbers as they, they've grown since the end of February, or since our first case in early February. Uh, and the bar graphs represent Pinellas County. Uh, you can you can see here, uh, this is when Florida declared the declaration, um, the White House. And then you can start seeing where we put in uh, uh, social distancing uh, policies with the bars and the nightclubs, the restaurants. Um, and then uh, something I have to add locally, the beach closures occurred around that time as well. Uh, the thing I have to say, uh, so a few things from this graph is that, um, as you can see, it has continued to go up. Um, we, have, we have yet to peak, and to some degree we expect that with the increased testing. Um, with some of the uh, social distancing policies, uh, it does sometimes take about a week or two to actually see the, the fruits of those po types of policies. Um, and, and, and there has been some, some questions about projections. It, it's, it's hard. Uh, there is some uncertainty with how we can project some of this, especially since in the interim we're also instituting these social distancing policies. And something that I've mentioned here is that we're dealing with, a, with a, an infection and a virus that is novel. We don't have a treatment. We don't have a vaccine. Uh, so the only tool in our toolkit right now is social distancing. So I, I appreciate the, the efforts everyone's putting out into the community as well as our leadership to continue to push that. Right? That's the only way. You have to take those personal protective uh, measures. Uh, you have to stay home when you can. You have to stay at home, especially when you're sick. 
uh, because it's not, it's not necessarily about you as an individual, but you may be protecting those that are most vulnerable <laughs> from developing severe disease. And to that end, I think we'd like to talk about what we can do as a commission instead of coming up here sitting together uh, at the end. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, yes, sir. And I just had, had asked my original question had been, um, this graph is kind of an odd graph to look at because you have two different y-axes here, and one of them is a 0 through 50, and that's the Pinellas count, and the other side is uh, the other side is a 0 through 1400, and it's a state, so right. it makes it it's hard to follow both on the same from a, from a, from a perspective of how we fit into, into the state. I think the escalation rate, right. you can see that is, that is a story that needs to be told. Um, but just back to the question of um, we take action today, and you continue to see the numbers stay steady in terms of increase. Very, you know, again, we had, well, at least the numbers that I had seen, there were like we had none last night or we're showing five from, you know, additional uh, in right. one day. I don't know the numbers that I'm looking at at home for Pinellas County. Okay. Um, there was no change from like 11 o'clock to 6 o'clock. And maybe from 6 to the previous 11, there was some change. So you only update that once a day. Twice right? a day. Twi twice, twice a day. Twice a day. So, so my question is, how do we start to adjust our, our, our actions as a, as a governing body to make it more strict or less strict? What are the numbers we, sh we need to be looking at? And um, in, terms, in terms of the projections, it is hard. And, 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 and we need so, to be thinking about it because at some point we have to come out of it. Right. And when and how are we going to come out of it? So, I mean, again, maybe we don't have the answers this morning, but right. it also goes to tightening it up and being more restrictive. What, like these numbers, five a day, if they go to 50 a day, that's right. pretty dramatic. Right. That's a big change, so I'm just wondering. No, no, no. You um, you make a good point, and again, with the uh, with the other variables put in place by some of the social uh, distancing policies, w it would be hard to show where that 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 turn would be. Uh, what I can say and what I know is that it can't continue the pro current projection it is now, right? So uh, you can see uh, at least on the graph that we haven't hit that peak yet. We haven't hit that bend. Um, and what I also can say is that if it continues to do so, does that cross that one line where it overwhelms the healthcare system? I think that's what we're all trying to do here. Um, and, and you're right, there probably isn't a magic bullet, and there, there isn't that, that magic data point as to when uh, we can make some of those decision points. And again, uh, being such a novel virus, we're learning things each and every day. Yeah. We're learning things like the virus may be more infectious and transmittable than the flu for example, and that uh, the more we're learning that it, it does have more severe complications, even for uh, to some degree to the young as well. So, uh, so with those types of variables, with those unknown factors, it, it is hard to somewhat project. Thank you, Dr. Chu. Ma Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Long. <coughs> Dr. Chow, am I wrong in thinking that the graph is a bit deceptive because we don't yet have the capacity to be doing large-scale testing. Right. So we don't really know how many people are already exposed or infected because they may or may not yet be exhibiting the criteria for getting a test. And that coupled with the fact that it's my understanding, and again, I'm not sure I'm correct, that you, you cannot get the test unless you have a prescription from a physician, correct? Well, so a few different ways. I think it depends on where you get the testing. Um, I believe that's one of the big care criteria. But, uh, but beyond that, too, um, it's, uh, you can uh, call the health department, work up with our epidemiologists, and if it, it meets the criteria, you can actually get that test. So, so you have the test yes. at the public health department yes. then? Yes. Um, and with the testing, with the testing, the we so right now in terms of, of those that we can test for the those that meet the criteria, I think we do have the, the enough supply. I do worry, however, as as this progresses, um, that uh, two or three weeks from now, do we have the same number of kits? But beyond that, too, you have to keep in mind that there is PPEs you have to gown up to do that test. So uh, so doing that could also uh, deplete those types of resources. So finding that delicate balance. Uh, on testing, I think it's important, but also focusing on some of the criteria, at least uh, currently. And then as a follow-up, Madam Chair, I know you're in touch with the local hospital CEOs, as several of us are. 
they are really panicking as, as a result of not being able to procure the necessary supplies or equipment that they need to work with folks that are infected. And so my, my question is, do you have a solid answer for when the state or the feds will release the supplies that perhaps the National Guard has on hand? Actually, I, I, I can tell you the timeline for that. Um, and I, I know that that is some of the concerns. And I, with our war yeah. groups, especially with the hospitals, we are looking at those factors, looking at the burn rates for the hospitals. Um, and I, I know the hospitals themselves are, are looking at that as a concern. And to some degree, uh, those are some of the concerns coming out of New York currently. Thank you. Oh. Yes, Commissioner, so I just want you to know we have a logistics person that's talking with all of our hospitals on a daily basis. Um, the state is struggling to get resources in, as they are at the federal level. Um, so we're talking with them every day to see if they're able to procure stuff locally, what they have coming in. So as we get those resources coming in, we can ensure that we're getting those to the facilities that have the most critical needs. Uh, yesterday, we had an amazing meeting uh, working with local manufacturers uh, to look at are there alternates that we can do for uh, PPE. And it was just incredible um, the number of folks that Mike Mandel and, and VDRS have really helped us identify local providers. Um, we are today, we started up three collection sites for medical supplies and put out the appeal yesterday uh, for anybody that has something. Uh, even through BDRS, we're reaching out to trade schools that teach people, um, salons, tattoo parlors, anybody, dentists, anybody that may have this type of protective equipment. So we are scouring everything locally and we're ensuring that we're working very closely not only with our hospitals but with our nursing homes and assisted living facilities and with our EMS providers to get them everything that we can. So thank you and your comments lead me to another subject matter I had on my list of questions to ask because you mentioned manufacturers and so my question is in your conversations with them have they talked at all about their ability to transition their production lines from what they are currently making now to perhaps making the necessary supplies for our health care providers? So uh, we've spoken with some, uh, we have uh, like uniform companies and other folks that are on board. So we're actually, we're working very closely. Baycare is helping us to come up with a prototype like for the masks in particular. Um, and then once that their isolation control folks approve uh, those products, then, then we'll start gearing up those folks to do that. So, so far we haven't heard anything that they can't do that. Um, the other thing is we've talked about 3D printing. Uh, so they were talking about even for the face shields, there's a head component that they can be 3D printed. And we're talking about how do you get the mylar and then how do you get the seal for that. So just a lot of really creative folks out there uh, helping us. And we'll continue to make those appeals to the public. And like I said, Two weeks ago, if you have a resource, please bring it to the table. Um, we're willing to look at every option. So now I just have one more, Madam Chair. Okay. So as it relates to the manufacturing facilities, and we have a lot of them in this county, mm -hmm. I'm assuming that means that those employees that work in those production lines are able to go to work and just practice the social distancing, the sanitary measures, and all of that, correct? A absolutely. Very good. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Commissioner Welch? Well, uh, Commissioner Long and I were on the same page, so she asked all my questions. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Yay! You know, I was, um, but going back to the data and the fact this data is imperfect because we haven't been testing, you know, as I was not sleeping this morning like all of us, yeah. um, I almost was longing for the days of tropical storms and hurricanes right. because... <laughs> You've no. got data. Oh, no. I said almost. No, said. I said almost. <laughs> Don't freak out, Kathy. But you had data. You knew the track. You had experience dealing with the issue. You knew it was going to end. This is, this is different than that. Um, so late breaking, the Senate approved the coronavirus bill. Does that impact the PPE issue? Is it an issue of funding or logistics? Or have we had a chance to look at that yet? I think it's logistics mm -hmm. at this point, really. Um, it's, so I also heard that China may be starting to get some of their manufacturing back online. I mean, this is a worldwide supply chain. That's the challenge. I mean, even in the call yesterday, and, and I had a lot of emails back and forth, so a number of our suppliers rely upon things coming uh, internationally. So uh, we've even helped push some stuff up to the White House and Department of Defense to try to help how do we get that supply chain back up and running. So. 
Well, this the, is a real challenge. Yeah, and the stories we're seeing and hearing and seeing on national news is really about our health system not being prepared to deal with any sustained outbreak because they don't have the PPE, they don't have the basic equipment. Yeah. And in my view, that, that um, informs the way we should move on this ordinance. And that's exactly the point behind this. So it's all about slowing it down, flattening mm -hmm. that curve, allow us to get these supply chains and these logistics back in place so we can better support the system because we know this is not, it's not, it's not going to end tomorrow, right? So we have to make sure that we've got those things in place to be able to support the people that are going to have to continue to carry on this work. That's why you know, the decision that you guys make this morning is so important. So can I ask a question about the ordinance since we're here? You know, this is um, unprecedented. This is life and death. And like a hurricane, there are going to be economic impacts, impacts on public health, and impacts on folks' careers. But the decision we make either saves lives or our inaction can cost lives. And that's where we are. And so if we're going to pass an ordinance, I think it needs to be an ordinance that has an impact. And I think y'all have done a great job on it. The one question I have, which I think is um, that lessens the impact of the ordinance, is the under D business in Pinellas County options. Kind of gives a big out if you say you're going to maintain the CDC social distancing guidelines. Correct. To me, that is the Achilles heel of this. Where, what page are you on, Commissioner? Page three. three. Page three on D. the original. Okay. original. Yep. Right. It seems like that weakens the ordinance. Can you speak to that? Do you have um, an alternative language? Um, so you're exactly right. Um, we tried to find a balance, <clears throat> hoping that, um, again, it's a reasonable risk that if a company um, is able, you know, we got so many emails from companies saying that we're at 20% mm -hmm. of our um, normal capacity and so you know if, if you've got a 300,000 square foot warehouse and you've got people every 50 feet is that any more of a risk than you know going to the grocery store it's probably less and so we were trying to find that balance to say do we really need to shut those down the the, the um, it would be easier to take out the social distancing say five folks it's time to stay at home it's easier. It's probably easier from an enforcement standpoint, <laughs> you know, when the sheriff gets calls saying, you know, this company's working or this. But, but the we were trying to find that balance to say if they're able to do that, they're able to distance people, they're able to stop the spread. Well, then they, you know, then it gives them an opportunity to be able to um, make that choice. Can I follow up? Yes, please. So is that both public facing and businesses that are just like manufacturing where they're not public facing does it, that apply to both it, it does apply to both we we had we i can show you like the eighteen thousand versions of this you <laughs> yeah. know and so we were looking at some of the public facing things i use the example of the bookstore well the reality is there's no way a public facing business like that is going to be able to employ social distancing practices and continue to operate and so it's kind of self-policing on that you cannot have 100 people in your store looking at books and employ social distancing practices. So you need to close, period. But if, the, if, if your particular situation is that, you know, you have one person coming in and they're dropping off, you know, something, but there's no, um, no congregation of large crowds or, or things, then it gives you to be able to make those choices. It is a absolute risk by having a, um, a more, uh, having an out like that. Um, but. We, we felt it was just a reasonable risk given the economic impact of small business. And um, so, and there's so many different situations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every time you, you know, it's like squeezing jello, you know, it just comes out over here and, and, and there's, a, there's a cause and effect for each thing. So it was, it was almost impossible to write it to cover the different situations sure. that, that people pleaded with us uh, to try to find that balance. And so we provided that. We think we can, you know, properly um, educate and police it. We think most people will do the right thing and those that don't will act. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I could, no, I could, we have somebody over here. Um, I mean, when I read this the second or third or fourth time, I saw the places where you can drive a truck through it. 
you know, if you are, first place it doesn't say if you're a retail operation you have to close. It says you can stay open if you can do the social distancing, however people aren't doing it. I mean, some people aren't doing it. And the one, it's not fair to the ones that are doing it to allow them to keep doing what they're doing right now. And that's what we're doing with this order. Just, I, you know, there are people being very responsible out there and there are people being very irresponsible. And if we don't somehow even that playing field, I mean, it, economically, I think that's unfair too. Commissioner Steele. And that's the difficult part of all of this is oftentimes we are thrust into the role of having to legislate for bad behavior and it's very unfortunate. And that being said though, um, I truly believe that this is a wonderful county and that if we can s send the right message that people will work on their social um, distancing and try to comply, keep people employed um, and stay safe. And I think you um, struck a good balance. If it doesn't work, we can come back together rapidly and make it stricter. But I think at the time being that this is probably um, the best effort that you can make. Um, I sent you, I had some <laughs> questions from people last night. I was trying to respond to them. I am not a lawyer, but I was trying my very best to um, read between the lines. But you know, some were suggesting that we mention specifically the federal guidelines and others suggested that we adopt the, some of the Illinois language mm -hmm. and I wanted to see if you could that, address that's, that. That's actually some of the language that we used. So okay. the, the, we, and I we know did, we used a lot of Broward counties. I did compare really, that. Really looked, we, uh, we took a, um, you know, uh, a more recent one that a county adopted, but, but some of the some of the language where it gets in essential businesses and the, some of those clarifications, definitions, and even um, where we employ social distancing practices, those are some of the languages that have been employed in other states. Um, you know, they've, they've implemented it, as you know. Um, you know, my, my son works, you know, in Illinois, and, and so they're, they're, you know, he's in a supply chain type area, and, and so they're able to operate, but they, you know, went down to, you know, 20% staffing. And so they have people that are outward facing, they have some people, but they have to have that internal to have the outward facing operation. And they were able to op continue to operate while employing those practices. They didn't get laid off. Um, so it, it, does it work? I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's an impossible task, you know, but we can, you know, it, it, and that's the reason we tried to employ some of the language we used. Okay. Um, um, another question that I, our emails lit up today about golf courses. <laughs> yes, so, they did. Mm -hmm. um, yes, no. I well, mean, they can. I mean, if you can employ social distancing practices, okay. I mean, you know, it's no different than going out for a run or a bike ride. You know, if um, they clean the carts after every time, they, they're, you know, um, I was out this weekend and they were having single cart. You go in a single cart, um, you know, and so there's ways for them to be able to recreate and, and be out in the, you know, open, uh, implement sanitiz sanitizing practices to where we don't spread it from person to person as they come through um, and they can continue to operate. So that would be allowed under this scenario. And somehow that's, in all of this, we have to figure out how we're going to educate so that people understand what this is all about. and. You know that it is in place for a week and um, you know I think the, our communication staff has been doing an outstanding job of getting emails out mm -hmm. but we do need to probably ramp up even more our educational process so before I finish I just want to share with you all one thing and um, this is um, comparing San Francisco the Bay Area to New York on March the 16th, before they took action for shelter in place, they had 310 cases in the Bay Area with five deaths. And there was 950 in New York with six deaths. In the last six days, the Bay Area is now at 786 cases, so it basically doubled. But New York is at 15,168. And, and the deaths are... 13 in the Bay Area and 114 in New York. And okay. what did San Francisco do? They did shelter in place. 
I prefer what we call safer at home. I think it's less um, yeah, I agree. frightening. That's what you're I think you came up with just the right message because people will get that. You're safer at home. And, and I would like to um, recognize that you know, we work in conjunction, obviously, with the sheriff's office. The sheriff is certainly here. Um, Mayor Kreisman is here. And also John Bennett, um, representing the city of Tampa, um, where we were trying to get the messaging is very, very important. You know, because nobody stays within their little confines. Um, and so we worked on that messaging to try to be consistent, not only with St. Pete, Tampa, and also Orlando, um, for us to have a, a constant message of people take this seriously um, and, and, and do the things that are, that are the responsible things to do to where we can prevent the spread. Commissioner Long. Yes. Um, so I have a constituent that called the Public Health Department yesterday and the constituent was t sent her to bay care and when she went to bay care they told her they were only testing until noon so do we know what the correct thing to tell people is do you, as it do relates? you have the time periods now i mean the, the reality is because of the ppe and the shortage of ppe people are limiting their hours um and you saw that you know over the weekend we had two testing sites in um, um, Pinellas County through BayCare, and they had to change that to one because of the, the protect, personal protective equipment and the lack of supply. We were wanting to stand up a third testing site that the sheriff had agreed to run, and we were going to come together and do that, but we can't get the supplies to be able to run it. We have the medical professionals. There's all kinds of requirements in terms of certifications and things like that. All that was put in place, but we can't get the test and the personal protective equipment to be able to run the site. So it continues, it's a national problem, um, as Kathy just talked about, something we're continuing to work on, but we, we certainly stand ready to ramp that up um, if the supply chain, you know, catches up to us. That's part of the reason we need to slow this down. Thank you. Mr. Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one, I, I, like Commissioner Seal, I would say I'm very comfortable with the language you all have come up with. Um, uh, it's obviously a lot of work in comparing what the other counties have been trying to review Orange County and some of the other ones that are in place. So I, I appreciate the conversations that I was able to have last night. Um, the question I get a lot is folks who live in Pinellas but work in other counties, um, they're going to be under whatever guidelines their county is as far as employers, that type of thing. That's correct. Um, you know, I think, uh, you know, our, our appeal is we're trying to find consistent language, certainly with Tampa. We weren't able to make that happen. Um, regionally, but but at least it's a start. And the the uh, kind of the constitutional question of if it's not expressly uh, forbidden, it's permitted type thing along this you're doing the CDC social distancing and that kind of thing. But those those guidelines are within uh, within this order, and so in, in fact um, we we believe we have the ability, um, you know, to enforce it. And and you certainly can speak with the sheriff regarding the enforceability of it. Um, it creates challenges, <laughs> um, but. But uh, that we think it's a right, it's a right balance. We talked specifically about golf courses. That's one of the big emails we've been getting, obviously. But and we specifically talk about uh, veterinarians and animal boarding. Um, I, the questions I got last night were from uh, uh, SPCA, Friends of Strays, those type of places mm -hmm. that are not specifically addressed. Um, I assume that they would be as long as they're following the guidelines. That is correct. I thought we did address those, but um, it says pet boarding, vet, veterinarian and boarding facilities. Um, it, it specifically calls that out um, within here. And again, I, I don't want us to get through going through every single exemption. I'm not lucky to do that. Um, <laughs> we, it, it, yeah. it needs to be clear to folks that um, no matter what ordinance we pass, no matter what's written in any of these things, if people don't take it seriously, if they don't handle it themselves, um, that none of this is going to mean anything. That people need to. Um, mm -hmm of self-regulate self-legislate and do the things that they need to do to protect their families and uh, we will be there every step of the way to try and guide them uh, in the least restrictive way that we can still maintain our quality of life so i appreciate your good work well said commissioner Mr. um well that was one of the things that i was going to say and i think that's you, you said it perfectly and i think we are kind of working alongside of all of our business owners all of our residents to try to come up with that you know that that scenario that just kind of you know 
goes through all the landmines that are out there and all the things uh -huh. that are creating problems. I do think the regional issue is important to discuss. I got a call from the mayor of Tarpon Springs who says, hey, what's PASCO doing? I mean, we're right here. My, my city's right next to Holiday. Um, East Lake, you know, you got Hillsboro, Pasco, and Pinellas. So some of those issues we, we need to obviously. We, we have had conversations with Pasco. Okay. I talked to Dan Bylas okay. um, yesterday. That's, that, I think that's really important. Yeah. The, just a couple of other things. Um, as it relates to recreation, I think we're trying to let people, not recreation, but exercise, getting out of their homes, doing some things within reason. Um, parks are still open. The mm -hmm. idea is don't congregate in the parks. Walk through the parks. Don't congregate on the trails. I got out on the trail the other day, and it was packed, and people are thinking they can do things the old way. So I think, again, back to the education that Commissioner Seal was talking about, we've got to let people know where we're seeing problems along the way. Mm -hmm. I mentioned to you a couple of days ago about having some kind of daily show, Power Up with Pinellas, 11 o'clock every day. Mm -hmm. We communicate to our residents the issues that we're seeing, the problems that we have, the things that we're considering, and, you know, here's the top five questions of the day that people were getting. I think somehow we need to be in touch with our residents every day. That's, we don't have that opportunity. I don't mean us up here, but somebody at Pinellas County. Um, so I think that's important. Um, the recreation piece, I think we've kind of addressed. I, I want to address yeah. one particular piece since we're on recreation, and that's with our boat ramps, okay? Um, because yeah. it's, a, it's, 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 a, it's an issue, okay? <clears throat> But we have we are not shutting down our boat ramps. People want to go out and boat. You know, they're, they've got their family. They need an outlet. It's no different than running out on the trail or biking or something like that. What we're imploring people to do is not to go to a you know sand dune and get a hundred people around of strangers that they don't know and have party central. Right. Um, you know, which is exactly what happened last weekend. We've talked with the state and some of those that are under state authority. They're, they're, we're going to be working hand in hand with them to try to get that message out and, and deal with that situation. But we don't want to punish all for a few. And so we're trying to find that balance. Yeah, and I think that gets back to what Commissioner Justice said, and that is that we're going to be working side by side to make sure that what we're asking you to do is being done. And if not, uh, there's always changes that we don't want to go down that road. But please, you know, self-regulate. And the only thing I was going to ask about that, and you know, again, I, I, the last thing I want to get into is is putting super bunches of teeth into what we're talking about. But if you bump into the third, the same person a third or fourth time, that is not listening and not, and, and the sheriff has ways to say, hey, I stopped this person, right. I've got their name in our system. The second and third time, it's going to be a fine. And it's the same thing with our businesses. We, it's kind of like code enforcement. Right. We we can't possibly go out there and police everything. But we do respond to people, re people that are working at these businesses that have said, they're not doing things right here. So they've let us know we've gone out there, we've noticed it, we've warned them a first time and a second time. There's got to be a point at which we say there's a fine. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think that's a piece that's missing that we need to put at least that, listen, we... Well, it's in here, okay? okay. There's, there's a have, fine in and here? And we have the ability. Well, again, this is... It, so I'll let the sheriff speak to this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I didn't see that. It, Sorry. It, it is in here. We don't call it out, okay? But it this is this is a criminal fine, uh, act. I think we need to call that. Think, and we can do that. We're imploring to people, but for those few, we'll deal with it. Yeah, if you don't mind. Let's hear from the sheriff. Before, let me just say this before I uh, address that question specifically, is that I really believe, <coughs> and excuse me for clearing my voice, I'm concerned about clearing my voice anymore because somebody <laughs> thinks I've had this allergy. I said it last time I was here You're for two and a half months. It's an allergy. Okay? Hey, I'm concerned needing. about clearing my yeah. voice. But anyhow, you gotta, you got to make light of it a little bit here when you can, I guess. But it's a very serious situation, there's no doubt about it. But uh, we all want the same thing. Every single one of us wants the same thing. You know, we all want to have effective health, safety, welfare, and most of all, we all want this thing behind us. The reality is it's going to be here for a period of time. Where the differences are, uh, whether it's in this room to some degree, whether it's in other governmental entities, we vary on the lane a little bit about how to get to the end zone. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are all on the same page and we're all working toward the same goal. I also believe that we all are, I know I am, extremely concerned about the individuals, about the people, uh, and about the business owners 
and their employees. And I can't tell you the number of people, as you all have, that I've talked to in the last few days. That and some are in tears because they got <clears throat> they got kids. Their paychecks don't exist anymore. And one of the things, and I told them and assured them that you all, I, the administrator, and everybody that's making these decisions are very aware of this. And one of the things that they say, they've said to me, and I've had several people say this to me, and it's a little harsh sometimes, but it's a reality, but it's not lost, is they say, you all are getting a paycheck. We're not. The people who are making these decisions aren't going to be financially impacted. I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. Moms and dads and kids. They said, look, then in order for us not to have to take this to a new level, you all need to step up. And you all need to help us help you. Because across the board, it is not being done right. Across the board, everybody is not where they need to be. And I agree, and the administrator and I have worked hand in hand, from shoulder to shoulder on this. And we don't want to see these businesses shut down, as you don't want to see these businesses shut down, but you want the right thing to be done. So if you have a manufacturing company in Oldsmar, a roofing company in Pinellas Park, uh, businesses out in High Point where they've got X number of people and they have the ability to do it right, do it right. And if you're not, step up. Step up so we don't have to shut you down. It, but you got to help us help you. And there is absolutely room in this community, and there's absolutely room in this region for people to do more and to do it better than what we're doing today. So I believe that this does strike the right balance. And getting to your point, Commissioner, you're absolutely correct. And we did this with a lot of dialogue, a lot of debate, a lot of discussion, and a lot of thought, mm -hmm. is give people the opportunity to do it right. So to have that or clause in that paragraph. So you either have to be an essential business, or you got to make sure it's being done right. Mm -hmm. And so that means, as you get into, and we use this as the example, it's become the example of the day because it's so flagrant. Yeah. And it's such a problem. You can't walk by, drive by, and walk into as an example, major bookstores. And you see them not, and I'll use this word in quotes, policing, their customers and their store and their staff. And if you're not going to do it, then shut it down. But you can police it. You can limit the number of people that come in. You can say, as opposed to having people shoulder to shoulder in the aisles reading books with their Star cup, Starbucks coffee cup in their hand, they can't sit in a cafe, but they can get it to go like business as usual. This isn't business as usual. But if you all want to keep in business, you want to be able to pay the paychecks to your employees, you have to do it differently. And this is the message. So getting to the uh, enforcement side of it and getting to where we are is that um, there is an opportunity for us uh, through this forum and through others uh, to make it clear to people that they need to do more, they need to do it better, that they need to do it differently, and that we absolutely are thinking about those roofers that are on that roof where you got four guys that are spread out. There's no problem with that. And what I would hate to see, I, I hope all of you concur, is I'd hate to see some type of an order that says that business can't exist. Because those people, this economic impact on the employees and the small business owners and the medium-sized business owners, and I've talked to you all individually or most of you individually in the last couple of days about the, the new federal law that takes effect on April 2nd and the impact that that's going to have as far as sick leave requirements are concerned and FMLA requirements are going to be concerned. And this is going to be a big, big impact on medium employers uh, from 50 up to 500 employees. And some of them aren't going to survive it. The last thing we need to do is to shut down more businesses on the back side of that. So we have the ability uh, to uh, get people and nudge them uh, to do it the way that we need to do it. We've got the personnel. Right now we've got a lot of personnel. The courts are shut down. The schools are shut down. We've got people uh, that we can get out there. And what I want to do is to have that conversation with those that are not adhering to the spirit, the intent, and the directives that are in here, but give them the opportunity themselves to get it right. So you got a choice. Either you fall into a category where it's not permitted because you don't fall under one of the essential businesses, or you can get it right by practicing the required distance in the other social distancing, the, the, the best practices that are required. So you either do it the right way, and if you're not doing it the right way, then we're going to have a conversation with you. And, it, and then 
is that there is an opportunity, and what the message needs to be and will be from us is, is that don't make us do it. We don't want to do it because we are so aware of the people that are hurting and the economic impact of this. But we're telling you, and we're giving you that forewarning, that forethought that there's, we got to do something differently here. So I, I'm willing to, uh, I think this is the right balance. I support this as it's drafted. Uh, I think it's good. And I think it gives us the opportunity to get out there and to educate people. And social media is, is a extremely valuable and widespread platform. But sometimes it also needs that in-person contact, especially if people uh, are taking it business as usual. This cannot be business as usual in this community. Can you answer the specific question that Commissioner Eggers had about yeah, where so, is so, it enforceable yeah, so in here? Y yes, and, and again, okay, we wanted to, and we that? talked about this, and I'll just tell you that it was, I think we, we concurred on it, obviously, but it was at my suggestion. Because I think that this message needs to be, we took it out as far as that, that but it's, it's here, is that all of these emergency resolutions and orders, all of them under Florida law, under 252, all of them are enforceable and they all carry uh, criminal penalties. But what we wanted to, to, the message we wanted to send here is help us help you, is that this isn't, we're shutting down Pinellas County, we're locking people, we haven't suspended the Constitution, this isn't martial law, this isn't some, you know, we're locking people in. But you all need to do more. And so we're trying to, and the thought is, is that we're gonna approach this uh, more with the carrot than the stick and, and trying to, but also send a firm message and we're going to do that through the actions uh, that we're going to take to enforce it. But, it, but Commissioner, it, it is, and uh, I hope we don't get there, and I hope we don't need to do it. But if somebody is uh, flagrantly violating it, mm -hmm. totally disregarding it, just saying, I'm not doing this, well, <laughs> we do have the option. Do we have, do we have the option to A, fine? Yeah. Do we have the option to B, uh, capture that company um, and, and shut them down versus creating another resolution that covers a whole bunch of people. In other words, can we pick out the bad actors that, we are, that we're getting reports on? We can find them after the second or third time, but it, the fines may be very easily to, to absorb, and they're going to be willing to do that, but can we actually go say, we're shutting you down? We've given you three. We've been out here four times. Your employees are telling us you're not doing the right things. We're shutting you down. Even though this thing says you have the right to be open, you're not doing it. Do we have that right? We have, we have the right to take all of the enforcement actions and use all of the enforcement remedies that are in Florida law. Would and you? those enforcement re remedies include uh, criminal violations and fines and taking all of the maximum enforcement actions. But what so, law are they violating that would... It, it's, I, mean, I, I believe it's... I believe it's I can get, cite you the statute now. I believe it's two fifty-two point five. Well, people are going to be asking. Okay. Yeah. But but, so. but it is. We can get that for you because all of these emergency orders is, is that they give the sheriff. This it, is a directive, though. And it, it's still under the uh, anything that violates <clears throat> the, under the state of emergency and under the uh, emergency uh, powers is is that all anything that violates it so as an example techni te order. technically okay here i'll give you an example is in the governor's executive order it says that you can't have visitors in nursing homes it doesn't say anything in there other than in his executive order it says you can't have visitors in nursing homes if somebody does visit we can go arrest them for visiting a nursing home because it's an, it's inherent in you got to read the whole chapter on emergency management so you have so so what's the difference between an order and a directive then None. It still falls under a resolution, okay, with, that you're adopting. So the resolution right. still has yes. the full power and enforcement. The, the, so why would we not say order then? We, we chose a different word. You could well, change I, it to I order. That, okay. You mean, if you our know. intention is to use it, be, be, uh, then why would it was we not it was really messaging, that. you know, to, to appeal to that. And if you want to change it to order, you certainly can. But let me let me answer your question specifically. Um, you know, so he, he do, obviously the sheriff has the authority to a violation of this, and he has the enforcement powers to fine, et cetera, and stuff. If we have a particular bad actor, then you know, again, you have, we have broad powers under the emergency declaration to do anything necessary to prevent 
you know, uh, uh, the public or the, uh, to ensure the public safety and health and welfare. Um, that that's uh, a lot of authority, and so in turn, if a business simply isn't complying, we can issue that order based upon that. Now, the enforceability is another issue, just like anything else. It's it would be no different if we banned all businesses, and a business said, "I'm going to ignore you and stay open." Right? Then we'd have to get an, a, a court order to be able to. Enforce well, I think it. it's going to be really important to communicate and be clear on what we mean by 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 following these things that we're doing. We're leaving that yeah. a lot in people's hands to work with us on this and, and so and, and, and so that's why too because we think it's I thought and I think the administrator did and other people we talked to and feedback from the community is it's important that people have a clear understanding and and that this is not because the concern and what the, a lot of feedback that I received and phone calls etc was is just that am I going to be locked in my house is this an order this is, and so you get into that, and that gives people a lot of anxiety. You give, and people, uh, by saying directive, and giving us the opportunity uh, to message this and to get out there and get out in the community. So what I was saying a minute ago, Commissioner, is social media is important, but also getting our people out in the community. And when we see things or we receive complaints of things, to be able to have that personal contact and say, look, is that we can do this easy way or the hard way. Okay, the hard way isn't going to be pretty, and the hard way isn't going to be fun, so do this the right way. And on one side, you can't complain to us and, 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 or express concern to us is probably a better way to say it about our companies, about our employees, and about uh, shutting us down. But we want to keep doing it the way we've been doing it. It isn't going to work that way. And so we will be out there, and we will be uh, addressing this. And if we see some of the things that we have seen, like this weekend out there, we did have problems at Three Rooker. We had problems at the Spoil Islands. I got a question from the Treasure Island City Manager yesterday about what are you going to do this weekend because I was out there all weekend, all weekend, Saturday and Sunday on the beaches. And the beaches were fine. But the Spoil Islands, they look like marinas. There were hundreds and hundreds of people out there. So, again, all we did is squeeze the balloon and move it. So we're going to address it, and we'll have extra patrols out there, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, and I think we can deal with it effectively. And if we see uh, that it's not being done effectively, we can come back, and we can tighten it down. But I, I really think that because, again, it's about these businesses, and an order that is tighter than this will cause – these businesses to shut their doors when it's not necessary that they do shut their doors. And again, I get back to these moms and these dads, these people that have families that we all feel it. We all feel it, and they're feeling it big time. And I think we need to be uh, absolutely cognizant and respectful of their position at the same time of the greater whole, like you all are concerned about, about not having this become more than what we have here in Pinellas County. So I, I, I I'm willing to work with everybody, uh, get our folks out, educate people, take it to a different level as far as communication and education is concerned, and at the same time, making sure that those who can operate within these parameters operate with these parameters and they're able to run their businesses and people are able to still uh, get a paycheck. And we will, I, I give you my assurances that we've got a lot of people, we'll get out there, we'll message this, and if you see things that you don't like, if you th see things and the community sees things, let us know about it, and we'll get people where they need to be uh, so that we don't have to uh, take it further. It's the last thing we want, but again, is, is that people need to know is, is that we are not where we need to be. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'll just answer some of your questions. Um, Joel White, County Attorney. Um, enforceability. Your, this resolution, if, if adopted, has the force of law. So we're acting under Chapter 252 in the Florida statutes, and it provides that violation of this order is a second-degree misdemeanor. It's not an order. Violation of your resolution okay. uh, is a second-degree misdemeanor, which is punishable by up to 60 days jail and or a $500 fine. Obviously, the prosecution and really enforcement is at the sheriff's discretion um, in the broader part of the county. Um, we have a range of options available to us should we have this bad actor, and we'll just use hypothetically a bad actor business that's not complying with CDC guidelines, not providing an essential service. Should we need to take action there? Your county administrator has a range of options to him available under the law to issue orders to close. We do always ultimately have the remedy to go to court and get an injunction to shut down a business. Um, we would process that through my office. We would certainly work with the sheriff and his staff to get the evidence that we would need to, to move that forward. Um, to be clear, courts are functioning still. They're just doing so remotely. 
and for the purposes particularly of civil actions, we can still apply to the court and petition them to get an order to close down a business should we encounter one of these really bad actors that is not you know, practicing social distancing and following CDC guidelines um, and otherwise creating an endangerment to the community. So we have a range of options um, from, you know, fines up to closure. And I think that's what, that we need to get that word out specifically that we, we mean business and we're going to take your business and shut it down if you don't comply. It's that simple. We're putting it in your hands, play ball, work with us. And if you don't, then we have remedies instead of taking, again, a whole category of businesses right, and right. that the other nine out of the ten are doing really what they're supposed to be doing and you shut the whole thing down. We want to pick out that one. They're going to get the message. Yeah. You know, if people haven't figured it out in this county is that you know, I'm not messing around. And we, we will with those because this is the whole thing. You don't punish the masses for the actions of one. And so when you have those ones, and I see these, I see some of these businesses that actually I take out businesses and restaurants, they actually have people standing in outside the businesses. And when you see people outside the businesses, they're spread out. You, you see some where they're letting them inside. These are the types of things through education and through information, and when we see that, and if we can get our people out, just go up and ask them and say, hey, look, that's probably not the best way to do this. Let me, ha let me tell you. And then if you get, if you get one that just is totally uh, and flagrantly violating it, we'll do what we need to do. And, and, and we'll uh, take the appropriate action. i just say one thing, one other thing here is, is off topic, because I want people to hear this, and you all, some of you ask me questions about it, and it has to do with the jail and, and jail population, um, is just to get this out, is, is that when we began this, uh, whatever it is, uh, it feels like many moons ago, but whatever it is now, 10 days ago, is the jail population, we, I told you then, is that we had um, over 3,000 inmates in the jail, and we had uh, 220 sleep on the floor. The jail population this morning is at an all-time low in the last 10 years. Uh, we're down to about 2,450 inmates, and we have very few on the floor. And I want to thank the chief judge, all the judges in the circuit, uh, the state attorney, the public defender, because of their work in looking at cases individually. We did not do a jail sweep. Uh, these were uh, prudently made decisions by the judiciary in cooperation with it the uh, state attorney and the public defender and the private defense bar, and we've been able to successfully reduce that jail population. In the state of Florida, we don't have one reported coronavirus case in any county jail in all 67 counties. It's because the sheriffs of Florida, including here, I locked down the Pinellas County Jail three weeks ago. We have no visitors, no lawyers, no professional visitors, no volunteers, no anybody, and I suggest to you, and people may find this hard to believe and some just don't, don't want to hear it, but I suggest to you because we've locked it down, you actually have less of a chance of getting coronavirus in the jail than you do out on the street because it's been locked down. And we, our bookings are down by two-thirds. Uh, normally, we book somewhere around 130, 140 people a day. We've had some days where we've been under 30. So it's, it, it's working. But either way, I uh, just wanted to mention that. I appreciate the indulgence, uh, uh, Commissioner Gerard, just to mention that to the public and to you all because I've gotten questions on it. Yeah. Good to hear you. Commissioner Peters, all right, someone. Thank you. I you know I already know the answer to this, but I did have people that were concerned about this that it didn't include sales that are already committed. So there's a closing on Wednesday for a business to be sold. It doesn't say specifically realtors or titles. I understand that under this it's included, but I just want to say publicly that it is included and confirm that so they can at least rest their fears and understand that because services. people do have closings scheduled and they're concerned about it. I think the key is to implement the social distancing guidelines. Right. Thank you. And I knew that. I just wanted to publicly say it so that they could, you know, feel a little better about it. So thank you. I do support it, and I really appreciate all the hard work that your team has put on this and the sheriff. I know you guys worked really, really hard, um, and, you know, I'm really impressed with the work that you've done, and, and you've done it very quickly and swiftly. So thank you for all the hard work with you and your team. Thanks. Mr. Welch. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the discussion. Um, and Sheriff, um, glad to hear you say that compliance will happen if we leave this provision for uh, compliance with the social distancing guidelines. And I say that because timing is, I mean, we're there now. The next two weeks matter. And so glad to hear you say that folks are going to get the message and your, your guys are going to be on the street along with uh, other law enforcement around the, the county. Um, one question that I asked before, and I think it's important that we get information on what we're doing to help businesses, small businesses, individuals connect with resources, uh, those in businesses that have been impacted, 
uh, even down to food distribution. So our economic mm -hmm. development department okay. has had outreach and connecting yeah. them with the uh, small business programs that are being offered. Uh, okay. We're watching the federal law closely and being able to communicate out. And, and as those programs roll out, we'll make sure that we communicate that with our small business owners. Okay. And the last question, uh, since we have the mayor and John Bennett, I, I'm, I'm assuming we screened him appropriately before he came in. <laughs> um, he has a card. This needs to be regional, as, as you've been working on. How does this um, work with any potential Tampa, Hillsboro uh, ordinance and St. Pete if it decides to do a different one? Well, I think um, everybody has their own <laughs> thoughts on this. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we were trying to get at the, with the Safer at Home is a message um, that will resonate throughout the region. Um, you know, and again, we're trying to strike that balance. Some, somebody else may do something different. Um, but if we have the same message and we have people take individual actions where they're taking this seriously, it has that same effect. So we're imploring that, um, but I'm sure you will see some differences amongst those. There was, there was a little bit of an effort to try to you know, coordinate some of that messaging, and it was just complicated with everybody doing kind of their own thing and trying to manage this. So, um, so this, we think, is the right thing. We've tried to find that right message where we can stay on target and, um, and have a consistent message to the best we can. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, one, I just wanted to say when we, when we closed the beaches, which we, we didn't close all the beaches, but people thought we closed all the beaches. And so that messaging of this is serious yeah. was effective and got out to the public and the public took notice of that. And I also wanted to compliment our communications department because the coronavirus portion of our website has a lot of really good information for the public, for businesses, and, and uh, had a great uh, frequently asked questions on the beach closures that I share with a lot of my constituents that asked about it. Um, the question I had is, what is the what would be our planned effective date of this be? The effective date, I think it's in resolution, is 24 hours after adoption. So it gives people time to act um, and consider the, the options that they need to take. All right. With that, Madam Chair, I'd like to move the resolution as written. We have quite a few cards here. We should let them speak. I don't know what the order of well, business is, but... Hold that thought. I promise to call on you. All right. You, you, you've said it a couple of times, and maybe there's such a subtle difference that I don't understand. Um, this whole idea of resolution versus order. Um, I, it, it, I, think, I think our residents do understand when we issue an order what that means. It's pretty, it's pretty strong and it's pretty straight. I'm not sure that the other gets it. So I just want to make sure I get that a subtle difference in the two and why we can't issue something that's a little bit more direct and clear on what, you know, this is an order. This isn't like a, oh, let's request it. Um, so just your thoughts. The thoughts are that you can change um, directive to order Thank um, you. In, in there with a Thank you. simple motion. Thank you. Commissioner Peters? Yeah, I had one question on the small business loan and that you're doing that. So um, I guess my request to you is if we could direct staff to be a little more flexible because I've had some businesses that have applied and they needed an amendment, but they couldn't do an amendment, so now they have to reapply for the whole process and redo the, and these businesses are so stressed out. They're, mm -hmm. They are so stressed out. And when they called me and said that now that they have to redo the entire process all over again because they required an amendment, is there any way we can be a little more flexible? Well, it's not our program, so we're, we we're, we're, we're providing with, an ombudsman service right, but could <laughs> to we, them and hooking them up with, with a, uh, a resources. Recommendation to them we certainly to can, and we'll work with flexible. them. So we, as you know, you have a small business business um, and a development program and our economic development department, they will work hand in hand with the businesses yeah. as best they can. Um, so I encourage them to reach out to them, but it's not our program. So we're, okay. well, we're if we we're, can make we're a recommendation to, to whoever it is that is in charge of those programs that we could be a little more flexible on this um, to reduce some of the stress because they're worried that now they're farther down the line and, and sure. how many more times are they going to have to reapply and redo the whole thing all over again. So there's any way that we can encourage a little more flexibility. We certainly we will. And the yeah. other thing, you, the question the commissioners had regarding if you have a constituent that calls, we have our citizen information center open. Um, and so if they have a concern, a question, um, or anything, if it comes through that, it will be fielded and staffed and handled appropriately within our emergency operations center. Thank you. Yes, so Barry, thank you for all of that information and kind of sort of in line with Commissioner Peter's question. I've had several nonprofits reach out to me with regard to a 
um, opportunity they've had to to apply for a fifty thousand dollar bridge loan and my question is is there someone within our arena or other that they could physically talk to that could help them work through the application process some of those uh, applications are extremely detailed and dot the i's cross the t's and take forever that's my first question my second question is how long do you anticipate it will be before the folks who are applying for for instance the heartfelt stories about people who have no paychecks they can't pay their rent they don't know how they're going to buy food i mean these are stories that really resonate i'm sure with all of us because we all have families and family members who are affected by this as well so it's great that we've got these programs coming my question is more okay great how long before mm -hmm. you have this opportunity in your hands okay so two questions one for nonprofits so we have as I think Kathy Perkins um, uh, explained earlier, we have 18 different uh, work groups that are working with various sectors of our community. Um, nonprofits is a key part of that. We have a rock call, which is our regional partners, uh, every single day. Um, so if they have those questions, they can bring those forward. I don't know if we can help them. Every grant's a little different, um, and so I don't have a, a team of you know grant people sitting around. Um, but we certainly can try to either hook them up, have them pair up between different nonprofits or other ways. People have been coming together in amazing ways, you know, so I'm sure there's a way that we can try to provide assistance to the best we can. Many of these programs, however, you know, as, I, as we said before, are, are outside of our control. We will certainly try to break the bureaucracy down at a higher level to where they can get assistance quick. We understand that it's, it's a matter of minutes, not days or months, that, you know, people need help. Um, and so to the extent we can, we will do everything we can to try to assist them and, and get them the assistance that they need. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We do have a number of people that want to speak. Oh, it's just kind of, I just oh, have ahead. just a couple quick questions. I'm sorry. You've mentioned bookstore a couple times. Um, I got a call from somebody about hobby stores. They're not on here as you can't keep, stay open. You have to close. I mean, they're, they're still allowed to stay open. Uh, bookstores and hobby stores. Um, but they have to maintain all of the things that we're talking about. Um, again, it's really important. You made the comment about like yeah. one copy store closed completely because they feel they couldn't handle it. The other right. one stayed open and it was packed in there. Now they can have people standing outside just like the restaurants do when they're waiting for pickup. So those, but those two are still in play. It, there, there are so many examples. I'm, um, I'm asking. That, yeah, those, yeah, they can okay. as long as they practice social distancing guidelines. You okay. know, the problem we're having is they they operate as business as usual. You know, when you talk about examples, you know, we have takeout where they have um, a spot on the ground, and six feet later they have another spot, and say right. stand on the dots. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, and they're helping people rather than having a line and you get a hundred people that stand back to back so, to back. And so my, so po my point is you, you know, have specifically said about playgrounds, we're closing those. So we're just trying to get the message out and get, getting right. back to this enforceability thing. Please comply so that we don't have to include bookstores in right. the list of businesses that have to be closed. It would be, it, at that Oops. point, it would be all re, all. all Public okay. facing retail. Well, you know, I mean, so so, but that's important notice again to get across to people. Work with us. Um, the other thing is, is that when our offices are out there, officers are out there. They're doing the work, our work, the sheriff's work, and for all of our residents. Please don't harass them because I'm getting calls that say, "Well, the police are out here harassing us." They're not harassing you. Yeah. They're simply making sure that you're doing what we've asked them to do. So give them a break, um, and then. Um, I do think there's one thing that we need to push out to our to our landlords out there. Keep your tenants, because what happened? They can do what they want to do. They let their tenant go that hasn't paid rent in a month or two. They're empty. They're not going to. They're not going to. They're not going to place another tenant in there that isn't having the same kind of challenges. So the idea really is to keep those tenants you have, work with them. There'll be a time when they come out of this thing. So we just have to make a plea. This isn't an order. This is different. That try to work with your tenants because there's, it's not going to be necessarily greener 
and you might develop a real sense of loyalty that you may not otherwise have had. So do your best. That's all I'm saying. I think that's really important. Thank you. That's all I had. Well, and I guess my comments are, I wish I was as optimistic as you all are that people are going to comply because I don't think they are. I mean, I have, I have a very close relative who was laid off yesterday that worked for a medical facility and they could not comply with the CDC guidelines, so they closed. There are people that are not doing that and will not do that. That are inside, you won't see the line out the door because they're behind closed doors. You know, you could have 50 people working in a warehouse right next to each other and you would never know it unless the employees tell us and a lot of them are not gonna tell us because they need the job. Well, it takes one. I understand. It takes one. Huh? It only takes one employee to tell us. Well, it only takes one employee to infect everybody else. No, I'm saying, I'm just but, saying to, to let us know that there's you know, a problem. That's all I'm saying. I think we need to remember that we're dealing with a pandemic here. We're not just, this is not a joke, you know, and I, I'm, I wish I, I wish I believed that the messaging was going to work. I just don't. Anyway, we have lots of people here to talk and first is Mayor Christman. Good morning. Good morning. I'm glad you have your wipe. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Good role modeling. <clears throat> um, Madam Chair, members of the Commission, thank you for the opportunity to address you. Let me begin my comments by first uh, saying thank you to, to Barry, his entire team, to Jewel. Um, our city, uh, myself and our city attorney have been working um, through the weekend, through late last night, uh, on language, as um, Barry said, um, and, and, and we agree with, it's, it's always better if we can do things um, countywide, regionally. So we've also been working with um, Mayor uh, Castor in Tampa. We've had conversations with uh, Mayor Dyer in Orlando. Um, you know, they, it, it, if we can't get the governor to act, we unfortunately have to act in, their, in his stead. Um, and so the language that you all have in front of you um, is kind of a, a combined effort of, of, of multiple governments here um, to come up with this. Uh, and I'm really in front of you because uh, there is one provision, and there's been discussion related to it already, uh, that I find very problematic. Uh, and, I, and, and, and I say that not easily because um, you know, in St. Petersburg, we are a city of small businesses. We are a city of locally owned businesses. It is what we thrive on. It is what makes us unique. Is the language that includes or cannot maintain CDC social distancing guidelines. And there's been a lot of conversation already about that. Uh, but, but my concern with that is, is with that language, basically any business in Pinellas County can stay open. This uh, safer at home policy does not close any business because every business in the county can make a claim that they are going to maintain CDC social distancing guidelines. Uh, and as many officers as, or deputies as the sheriff has, as many officers as I have in St. Petersburg, there's not enough of them to go around to businesses that we have and make sure that they are following CDC social distancing guidelines. And so we have to ask ourselves this question. What, is the, what are we trying to accomplish with this order, with the Safer at Home? If what we're trying to accomplish is to encourage people and to get people to stay at home as much as they can unless they are going out because they have an essential need, whether it's to go to a park and for, to rec, uh, to, for physical fitness, and we want people to be healthy. That's really important or it's because they've got to get food, whether it's at a takeout restaurant or it's at a grocery store or to go to a doctor or a pharmacist or they've got a sick pet. Those are clearly essential services and there's a long definition of things that constitute essential services. But I believe it's very hard to argue that getting a picture framed at a frame store or buying a new mattress at a mattress store or a book, whether it's a Barnes and Noble or it's a small bookstore, is an essential service that we want people to leave their homes and not stay in their homes. We want to make it okay for them to leave their home and go out and go to that store. 
that defeats the whole purpose of what we're trying to accomplish, which is to keep people as much as we can in their homes or around their homes so that they are safe and they're not contaminating someone else. The, we've heard a lot about the Barnes & Noble example, uh, and there's no question it's been packed. But they can very easily say, yes, we're going to maintain social distancing. Then it's incumbent on the sheriff to have to send somebody out to make sure that, in fact, they are. You could have a smaller bookstore, and they may have one or two people. But if they have five people that come in and they're trying to survive financially, it's going to be hard for them to say, no, 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 you, you have to leave because we got to maintain social distancing. This one time, we'll let it happen. Well, that one time may be the one time too many. And we just don't have the time right now. Based on the, the medical science that we know and what we're lacking as far as uh, supplies and equipment for our hospitals to be overrun. This is the last thing any of us want to do. We don't want to do anything that hurts our small businesses. But we have to make a choice between public safety and health or our small businesses, unfortunately. And that's, that's the position we've been stuck in. None of us want to be in this position. None of us want to make this decision. Uh, but if we're truly going to flatten the curve, if we're going to try and prevent this from getting to where it is in other places, unfortunately, we have to, have, we have to take that action. We've provided, uh, and I don't know, Barry, have they got a copy of this language? We have. No. We have so the alternative <laughs> language that we were proposing for that paragraph, that first sentence, would say, with respect to any for-profit or non-profit business entity, regardless of corporate structure or formation, operating within Pinellas County, such business entity is hereby ordered to cease operations within Pinellas County that require in-person attendance, except as needed to provide essential business or operations. To the extent that any business operations may be maintained by telecommuting or other remote means while allowing people to remain at home, this order does not apply to such remote business activities. So we're still trying to keep some of those businesses that don't necessarily have to have that person-to-person -person contact. We're trying to help them stay open. Uh, but you know, here's what I see happening if, if it passes the way it is. If you, if you know Central Avenue in St. Pete, you know there's some great, not only restaurants, but there's some great galleries, there's some great clothing stores, antique shops. So I see a weekend now, Saturday, where people are walking up and down Central and they're just going in from shop to shop because they're still open. Now, that one person that goes in that shop, if, they're, if they've got an, uh, and they don't know they're positive, they're now going into multiple shops and they're infecting people in those multiple shops. And so we're not going to be able to prevent it because they could go to a grocery store. No question. If you, if you say, well, couldn't they go to a grocery store? They could. But we're trying to limit the opportunity for that to happen. We're trying to limit the spread to the best ability we can, keeping only essential businesses open. Now, the sheriff said one thing that I, I, I thought was kind of ironic. He said that they did a lockdown in the jail, and they've got no cases in the state at all with a lockdown. So that's, a, that's, too, that's an extreme uh, they are able to do in jails. I'm not advocating for that. I'm not advocating for martial law. I'm not advocating for a lockdown. Um, I'm not advocating for a curfew. But it, it works. And so you take that extra step further, um, you make a difference. And, and no disrespect is intended when I make this comment either. Uh, but you know, we're talking about policy. You all are the policy makers. Whatever policy you put in place, um, this sheriff, my chief of police, they're going to enforce that. That's their job, to enforce the law. You all are the policy makers. You have a chance to make policy that will make a difference if we don't make this change, I don't think this is going to have the impact you want. Um, every business can stay open, and that's, that's not going to get us anywhere. It's not going to move the ball. So I just urge you to strongly consider this language. Um, I think this is, if we're going to really make a difference, this is what we need to do. Thank, Thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Questions? Does this replace? language here or is it just an addition? It, it, it would be, it would replace um, the Sentence first seven, sentence D. from closed storefront section operations D. in section, section D, D to CDC, so well, I'll let Jewel answer. <laughs>
we, we prepared this in advance of that. Obviously, we knew the, the mayor uh, was coming. So we, we took that Section D and incorporated the concept of what, of what he's asking for into that section. That would be more restrictive. What you would see in the language that we passed out to you all, these are excerpts taken from a resolution that the city had prepared, and I was in communication with the city attorney uh, for St. Petersburg. So, and I'll put it here, but this is what we just handed to the commissioners. Um, under what you all have is Section D. We would replace that opening paragraph with what you see here. The and entire paragraph. The entire paragraph. Okay. It would be a more forceful directive to close. Um, and then what you see down below is essentially a definition that I think if we were to go with the first paragraph would be wise to add, which defines what is meant by minimum business operations. And you can see that term is used right here. So this, again, this is language that's taken directly from a resolution that the city had prepared. And I, again, I was in contact with the city attorney. And the what would happen is this paragraph on what you have would be replaced with this paragraph. And again, that is a more forceful statement that these businesses are to close unless they uh, are considered an essential service, and that would be the whole list. The, the, the list low, under D would remain the same. Okay. Um, so unless it's an, uh, providing an essential service, it would be closed. So, um, again, one of the things, and you made some comments about our small businesses, which we all share, uh, you know, obviously in this country, in this state, certainly in our communities here. But what, you know, if we don't, if this isn't handled in Pasco County, in Hillsborough County, then f folks are going to go across the, the plate. You know, they're going to leave their homes, leave our businesses that could have, again, I understand your point loud and clear, but they're going to go somewhere else and make those businesses survive over there and at our expense. And again, I know this is all it's health, safety, and welfare. It's all three that are critically important, probably in that order, or safety, health, and welfare, whichever order, but welfare is also important. And when I say welfare, I'm talking about people surviving, having money to buy food, you know, um, not having those those situations that come up that lead to total depression, isolation, and suicide. So there's a, there's a health component to going too far with it, and if our neighbors aren't doing it anyway, it really hurts not only the, you know, anyway, I've said it, so, you know, your thoughts. If, if I may respond. Yeah, please. And, and, and I understand that argument. Um, for, first, first and foremost, I, I think what we're talking about from the type of businesses that are not essential, and I gave a couple examples, a framing store, or a mattress uh, company, uh, or a bookstore, you know, it, 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 if, uh, it, it's hard to imagine, truthfully, someone that lives in downtown St. Pete uh, driving to Pasco County to buy a book, which they could order on Amazon if, if they need it that badly. Um, what this does is it sends a stronger <clears throat> message. And we've talked a lot about education mm -hmm. and messaging mm -hmm. and trying to send a forceful message to our community about how seriously we're taking this and how seriously they need to be taking this. And so, yeah, they could do that. My hope, and we kind of saw this happen a little bit with the last order that we took, uh, a number of other communities after we all took a position have followed us, um, including the state, which then put in the 50% rule on restaurants, if you remember. They hadn't had that policy, and they took it. And you see counties all over the state of Florida and cities all over the state of Florida, in the absence of leadership from um, the state government, are now taking actions themselves because yeah. they well, feel like they need yeah. to do something. And I think you, that's a good point. And you know, hopefully there'll be some followers on this. But we know bricks and mortar on our retail industry are threatened every day from the big users, the big boxes, and everything else. And now this comes along, and it's going to slam them. I understand your point, and I, you know, I'm, but I don't want them going across and, and populating others and doing the same damage and then bringing it back here. So if I can make yep. one last point to, to okay. the response to that, is the quicker we're able to flatten the curve, mm -hmm. the shorter the impact on the economy. The longer this spike happens and the less we're able to, to, to start reducing it, the longer the impact, the negative impact is going to have on our business community, 
And so if, if this is, ends up being a 30-day, I don't know how long it will be, but let's say it's a 30-day or even a 45-day or 60-day, it's going to be hard on the businesses, no question. But if it's six months, we have a whole lot more victims uh, in, our, in our economy than, than those few. Yeah. And, and again, neither of them are good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thanks for providing Thank this. Uh, Maria Gast Gatsis. Good morning. 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 And I do have something for all the council, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I don't know. Well, these are for all of them. I made a copy for every single one of them. My name is um, Maria Gotzis, and I grew up in, on Clearwater Beach. Um, I now reside in Palm Harbor. I've been a proud citizen of Pinellas County for 50 years. Um, and I'm a hairdresser for 33 years. Um, it's my life's passion, and I do work two jobs as a hairdresser. My one uh, hair salon that is in a, uh, an assisted living facility has been shut down. I'm no longer, obviously, to go into the uh, hair um, salon at the assisted f living facility because I'm a non-essential worker there and it breaks my heart because those people that um, they're my special clients however I'm still working three days a week at my salon Sweet Sweets which is a uh, unique salon setup um, it's kind of like a cubicle it's a small size like child's like room with a sliding glass door um, I see one client at a time it's perfectly set up for social distancing because each, like I said, each salon has its own sliding glass door. So it isola isolates us from other clients and other um, um, hairstylists. Um, it has its own shampoo chair. It has its own uh, station. Anyway, so what I want to get to is it is... Um, this is a letter on the, the first letter is the governor's office. The, le the second one is a letter that was written by a franchise owner and it says, good morning. I am certain that the mandatory closing, and I don't know, you know, eventually hair salons might come under this. So um, let me just, as non- uh, non-essential businesses and if you talk to many ladies I think hair salons are essential and to men <laughs> to get haircuts but anyways and their roots done I'm certain that the mandatory closing of hair salons is being considered and would like to provide some possible alternatives to increase social distancing while maintaining some income for the stylist given that most stylists are self-employed and many are single parents, closing the salons would have an inordinate impact. Instead, many, maybe we could implement some of the following. Restrict salon occupancy to a total of 10 by employee and client scheduling. Have clients wait in the car until called or text by their stylist. No waiting in the lobby. D Oh, I didn't know I had time. Oh, I didn't know there was a time <laughs> limit. We have your stuff here. Okay, great. So, all right. Thank you for bringing this. Okay, so you've got the things there. Yes, okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, sorry, you have three minutes when I call your name. Uh, Jeff Santone. Morning. Good morning. Well, thank you. Uh, a lot of what you said was uh, answered a lot of my questions. Uh, I just had a few, I guess, concerns about how quick all of this is moving based off of what seems to me not a whole lot of information. Uh, we have roughly 900,000 people in this county. We have 45 cases, which is less than half of a percent. And we've rapidly increased how fast we're moving to 
safer at home without seeing what's happened with the social distancing that you've already implemented. And the message I've gotten so far is, um, you know, we've got a lot of people that are doing good things, and we've got a lot of people that aren't. And that seems very subjective to make policy changes based off of a lot of people that you haven't named a number of, a couple hundred people out on the island or on a, a sandbar, uh, some businesses that uh, aren't complying. But I haven't heard specifics of who, what, when, where to make these policy changes. And to me, it seems that it's moving very, very fast without a whole lot of data. And now we're listening to a mayor from another county who's trying to influence. Uh, he's from this county. He's from this oh, county. From, sorry, <laughs> we're listening from Tampa Bay or St. Petersburg, uh, what he would like to have your language say. And so I may not be able to stop what's going on here, and what I say may not make a difference. Uh, but as far as the language goes now, our company that we work at, uh, we took it very seriously. And they put all of our at-risk people at home, you know, work from home. And here's all this cleaning supplies you guys need. Are all of you 10 feet apart where you sit? Uh, to me, it doesn't seem fair that you guys are starting to move very, very fast based off of a few bad apples. And all I kept hearing was a bookstore, a coffee shop, a sand key. You know, these things to me don't seem to rise to the level of safer at home. And then at the end of this, it doesn't say how long this lasts till the state of emergency is declared over. So when is that? Which we do it every week. Every week. Am I allowed to come next week if you do safer at home? Of course. Sure. Because some of these say public barring. Yes? Yeah, we'll have a way to get We'll have a way input. for you to give input, whether give input. we're physically yes, here or not. Okay. Well, that's all I wanted to say, but I, I did want to stress the fact that um, listening to the sheriff saying it's not martial law yet and asking good questions of where do we ratchet it up to, to me, that's a little bit scary. You know, all of a sudden you give a number and now it's martial law. You know, there's no way to say that that's not going to happen, given the fact that you've moved in this fast, this far. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff Bloomberg. Morning. 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 Uh, you'll have to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you have to excuse me. I had to change my comments because the only thing I heard was we were looking at shutting down the county, and I was thinking we're of a California t style shutdown. Um, I didn't have a draft copy of the of the resolution, so I had no idea what we were looking at. So uh, to tell you a little bit about our company, we employ 85 people. Currently, we had to let go of a few when the, the our, our company is travel based, and that we have clients travel to this area close to 150 people a week uh, to attend seminars at our office and uh, from all over the U.S. and Canada. So obviously we had to stop doing that uh, last week. And uh, so basically it put us in a position where we had to retool to where we're now having to move everything to being online. All right. So we are in the process of that. The measures we've taken at the company, we're in a 55,000 square foot building, is we are, uh, we've sent all of our at-risk staff to work from home. Um, we practice social distancing. Every staff member has a disinfected wipes at their desks. There's hand sanitizer stations everywhere. We've been very, very uh, vigilant to observe CDC guidelines, which was part of a problem because it went from 250 people to 50 people to 10 people in less than four days. That was why we went from last Monday, I'm canceling everybody for the next month plus as far as our clients. So our whole business model got blown up. So we're attempting to keep our employees. All of the executives and senior people at the company took severe pay cuts. We're attempting to keep all of our employees, especially the most vulnerable. If I'm in a position where we're doing what the mayor of St. Petersburg says, my minimum business operations are reduced down to anything below what you have in the resolution, then I'm going to have to start divesting myself of employees. And Florida unemployment, I believe, maxes out at $275 a week. Correct? I don't know. I believe it does. Okay. So here's the problem. Shutting down retail businesses for a 30-day period, has that even been done before? I, I mean, this is like an experiment. The FDA tests a drug through, through phase three trials with, you know, with the, uh, from phase 3A and 3B before they actually will release it, which is why we're waiting for a vaccine. And now we're talking about shutting down retail businesses for 30 to 60 days. I think the bigger concern we're going to have in a month to two months from now is massive social unrest, crime waves, because people have to eat. 
And I don't think we have enough police and sheriff, you know, sheriff's deputies to patrol all that. Okay, so we have to practice a, a, a modicum of restraint as we're doing this. I, I, I agree with the resolution as written. I agree with the resolution. If we could keep more retail businesses open or keep businesses open, I think that's fine. I think that uh, adding any type of further restrictions is going to put a lot of us small business owners, because don't worry about me. I mean, I'll figure something out, even if I have to leave the area eventually. Okay, it's my employees. I want to keep them all. I don't want to have to fire people. All right, and this is like single moms, lots of single moms. I mean, this is... Yeah, it's real. Anyway, so I agree with the resolution as written, but I ask that we don't make further modifications as the mayor of St. Petersburg suggested. Thank you. Thank you. And Gerald Krantz. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I'm not a business owner. I'm just a worker here in Clearwater. And um, last night, I by chance came across the article in the Tampa Bay Times that this was going on. Scared the living out of me. Okay, I hardly got any sleep last night. Uh, some of the people I work for, some of the girls that are single mothers, a um, couple days ago were crying. They're saying, if this happens and I'm out of work, what am I going to do? You know, um, I echo the two last gentlemen's comments. Um, and um, I, this is not as bad as I thought it was going to be. But you guys have a lot of power. And personally, scary. I would ask that maybe you guys and some of the other employees, government employees, maybe not take a salary during this period. Let's see how you guys function that way. Some of your employees, okay? I want you guys to feel it like everybody else. And that's all I really have to say. Thank you understand you. that we didn't create this issue. No. But I mean, we're just trying to do what's best for everyone. Well, I know, but you guys make the decisions. We haven't okay? made a decision yet. So. I know. But you can, not just today, but in the future, we don't know how long this is going to last. Yes, we know. Okay? Okay. This could be long term, but people still have to live. We know. And the things that I have seen. Sir, we know. I'm sorry I shouldn't have responded and started that all over. I think no, no, no. I, I'm glad you did, actually, because, because um, the things that I've seen when I've been out, which hasn't been that much other than going to work and part of my job, what have you, I see a lot of seniors. Um, they're practicing social distancing. I think everybody's taking this seriously except for a few people. And, of course, you know, in this county, there's almost a million residents, right? It right. may be over. I don't know. Okay. How I got in here, I mean, I'm probably one of the few citizens. I thought I was going to be out in the parking lot with a bunch of people. I don't think anybody knew about this meeting. I came across that article. I was looking to uh, read something about uh, Tom Brady, and somehow I ended up on Tampa Bay <laughs> Times, and then I saw that minuscule little box about the meeting. I mean, it's... That's, that's what I'd like to see, is if you can get your message out better, you know, because this is scary to a lot of people. Thank you. So anyways, thank you. Um, Star Hillman? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. No? Okay. Thank you. Um, Jim, Jim Bright something. Bridgeport. Bridgeport. Thank you. Sorry about that. <laughs> I had to write it without my glasses. Oh, okay. Madam Chairman. <laughs> good morning. Commissioners, good morning. Morning. You know, um, I, I, I also came here with uh, uh, quite a bit of trepidation. You know, I was genuinely concerned when I read what I read. And um, I actually uh, own businesses abroad and here in Pinellas County. So I've, I've witnessed personally the extreme. I actually own a business in Italy. And um, I have staff over there that, that, that we're doing everything we can. In point of fact, our work here is what's supporting the people over there. Everything we can to keep them functioning. And then I read this yesterday, and I, I'm like, oh, my God, what, 
what is going on. I, I, I really, I am a little bit calmed, um, and, and no disrespect to the, the gentleman from St. Petersburg, I, I absolutely do not agree with his, his suggestion. Um, as a business owner, um, you know, we employ, we work in the energy, energy sector, so we're, we're used to disaster mitigation, our risk management uh, protocols are kind of built to actually operate in this scenario. Um, so we're able to pare down, send people away. We have the critical jobs that, have, that, that, that technically have to be on site, but we're able to really spread everything out and, 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 and actually kind of work through this. But there are a lot of people that I employ that will not have jobs if you, you move forward this way, and that's just heartbreaking. And I, and, 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 and I am comforted by the fact that I can honestly see that you're not just taking this lightly. So that, I, I, I didn't know what I was going to walk into this morning. So that is, and, I, and I'm really very, very pleased with uh, the staff and, and, and um, the sheriff. Um, I really see your, con your concern. So I, I really want to say thank you. But um, I honestly want you to just please take a breath, you know, before we move aggressively. And, um, you know, it, it is, uh, I mean, we've all lived through, uh, Hurricanes, we know what those are like. I mean, I've, I've, I've been here for upwards of 30 years running a business, so. Um, and I, I mean, can we know that drill, and we know that that is a finite thing. Okay, this is slightly different. So before we go and do something dramatic, really, really, I would say that we measure four or five times and really think about it. So that's what I want to share is just that just really consider um, the actual economic impact of what's going to happen. Um, you know, to a family that is, there are many families in our county, unfortunately, that live hand to mouth, and you all know that they're your constituents. And um, we really must consider that. So the, the resolution, as, as you're looking at it now, I'm personally okay with it, but to employ draconian measures at this point, I think would be very, very premature. So I respectfully ask you to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tony, and I'm not even going to try on that last name. Tony, last name starts with a T. No, no, no Tony. No, Tony. Okay. Oh. He's Next is Tom Rask. Morning, Commissioners. Morning. Hi there. Toomey is the pronunciation. Toomey. Okay. Yeah, a little bit tricky. <laughs> Firstly, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak and have uh, my voice heard. I'm an employee. I'm, I don't own a business in this in this county. I'm an employee, and I'd like to um, firstly say I came here also not knowing what to expect and having read uh, the verbiage of the uh, resolution uh, and quite calmed on it. Uh, I'm here representing uh, a company, I suppose, or employers that have taken a very proactive, responsible approach to this situation. <clears throat> um, you know, when you look at the sanitisation that we put throughout our organisation, bringing extra staff in on weekends to clean, disinfect and sanitise our environment, all on their own merit, on their own origination, to make it safe for us. And I think for every bad actor that you have out there that is doing, you know, uh, breaking what you'd call the, the safe protocols, there is dozens and dozens and dozens of organisations and business owners out there doing the right thing. Uh, so I was encouraged to read the verbiage that you're putting forward and know that that supports those people. And um, I'd encourage you to more look at, you know, backing those up because I have a lot of colleagues they can't go a week without a paycheck or potentially a month without a paycheck. Some of us can, the majority cannot. So thank you for taking the time to really investigate this and push something that's proactive uh, and supports the community as a whole. So thank you for your time. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Tom Rask. He's probably in the back. He's probably out. Oh, he's right, right there. there. Oh, there he is. Good morning. Good morning. Um, if I cough, it's due to allergies. It's a wet cough, not a dry cough. Uh, this is, of course, very serious. Unfortunately, the numbers coming out of other locations, other countries shows that, and the U.S. shows we're unfortunately on the same track 
as on the same slope as Italy and Spain. I don't own a business in Italy, but I do have business, for instance, in Holland. They reported 80 deaths today so far. Um, it's very serious. It's going to get worse. You're going to be back here um, unless there is a cure, and it doesn't look like there is one anytime soon. Um, there's talk about essential services. Well, what is essential? I know one thing is essential, and that's the First Amendment. And that's why I decided to come here today on my bike. Pardon my appearance, but um, I just decided to make this part of my bike ride today. And the, the, our constitutional rights are essential. Um, the Founding Fathers, as a constitutional lawyer pointed out in an article, they were, well, they were very familiar with pandemics, and they made no exception for pandemics. They could have easily put it in. Uh, for instance, it's in the Constitution, they can suspend habeas corpus if the public safety so requires. There's an exception. Um, one question, thinking about all this, too, in no particular order, is will, will COVID-19 go away during the summer? I, I'm not sure it is, but uh, I'm not sure it's that kind of flu, in which case this means it's going to be with us for a while. I also wanted to point out that in your messaging to people, you should be practicing safe distancing yourself. I saw here from the media room a lot of employ a lot of people up here at the lectern being very close to each other. A previous speaker talked about the danger of massive social unrest, and I'm glad he brought that up because please don't put the sheriff in a position of having to enforce something that, that isn't enforceable because the people don't want it enforced. Um, law enforcement are sheepdogs. You don't need that many sheep dogs to keep a, sh a, a flock in, 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 in line. But, you know, don't put them in a position where they can't keep the flock in line. Finally, the county attorney, I think, is, is cited um, Florida Statutes 252.50 as authority for this, any violation of this resolution being a misdemeanor. But if you read the text, and I can pull it out and read it, it says that uh, it's a misdemeanor if you violate any rule or order. Order. This is not an order. This is a resolution. Okay? So I had a lot of the same questions about resolution versus order. Um, if I can just finish up, Madam Chair. I will comply with any directive if it's given in the spirit of, please do this. If you start ordering people around, it may not go so well. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea D'Agostini. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. My name is Andrea, and I'm Italian, actually. I didn't come from Italy today, but uh, I'm originally Italian. It's all good. <laughs> Thanks all good. for clarifying that. So, but anyway, and um, I believe that um, you see the news, but I don't know if you know what's happening, really, there. Um, I would like to, I've been in the United States since 2013, and I think that uh, Italy right now is shut down. and what you see, all the uh, worry about the, the disease is, is not what people are worried about. They're worried about the fact that they don't know what I'm going to do tomorrow. Businesses are closing, people are laid off, and that's the real danger. And I believe the United States is not a country that is designed to shut down. I, I really do believe that for my experience with this amazing country and the amazing opportunities. I am myself uh, an executive of a company. I have many juniors. and. Um, I do not see how this can go well if uh, we don't, A, trust uh, the American people that they will do the right thing. I do have trust in that. Of course, I know I've not been here in my life, right? I know the Italians and the Americans. I have more trust in the Americans doing the right thing. <laughs> and uh, now if you ask me, do you trust yourself in doing the right thing? Okay, that's a completely different discussion. <laughs> but but um, I think the United States are an incredible country, and I really believe people will practice um, anything that they need to practice in order to move forward with their businesses. I, I, United States are not designed to shut down. There will be worse, the cure will be worse than the disease. In my understanding and what I have observed and the numbers that I, that I have observed. Now, um, I don't know how many seconds I have. Okay, I can see it. Um, now, as far, let me say a word, as far as Italy is concerned, I have uh, parents uh, that are doctors and that are working in the hospitals and uh, their communication is very different than the media's communication. Their communication is that they, I spoke with two, so it's not a generality, just two, which are my aunt and uncle. 
is that uh, the vast majority of the circumstances in which uh, the situation was very uh, dangerous or critical were already dangerous and critical situations. So it wasn't that uh, these people were very healthy, life was perfect, they were winning, they were like, yeah, it wasn't like that. They were mostly upwards of eight years old and with existing conditions. And uh, even they are more worried about the hysteria of people jumping in the hospitals because of concerns. And they're thinking that uh, the real danger right now is the economical <coughs> infrastructure and the fact that it will not sustain. It, it can't work if people don't produce. So, but I, I have seen that you, you have the same viewpoint. I was seeing that you were concerned about a realtor and their ability to produce and to work, and I love that viewpoint. And, and I think you all have the same viewpoint. So I will really encourage you to uh, move forward with the way the, the proposal is being put together. I think it takes care of businesses, and it gives trust to the American people, which are an amazing, an amazing, really an amazing country. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you Thank very you. much. Uh, Chris, excuse me, <laughs> Verculin. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. I don't think you try this. It's a difficult one. It's been since uh, since I was in school. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, thank you. So, I will say, I was expecting something different from resolution than what you have. I'm very proud of all of you for providing a metered, sensical resolution. It gives me a lot of trust in my government. I appreciate that from you guys. Uh, some of the things I wrote in here might not apply because of me not knowing that. I didn't have a copy of the resolution, but I'll go ahead anyway. So I've heard anecdotes regarding certain citizens not heeding the warnings of health professionals. Uh, but in government, we don't act on an anecdotes. We uh, fear or emotion. It is prudent that we root our actions not on anecdotes, but on hard figures. We have an incredibly serious matter at hand, the means by which Pinellas County earns its keep. Uh, no government check will keep the government. No government check will keep the businesses that people have saved, scraped, and sweated for over the course of their lives from shuttering and closing forever. I'm interested in hearing what metrics the emergency board has concluded, uh, has considered that dictate the need for such a lockdown. Um, we need hard numbers. Is it total cases, per capita cases, acceleration rate of infection? or some other professional metric that we need to consider. Us as citizens need to know that. So we need to know if, if that metric is met for going into the resolution and when that is going to be met for going out of the resolution. At some point, our efforts reach a point of diminishing return. So are we going to, this is one of the things that doesn't really apply, we're not providing a total lockdown, but at some point, putting in legislation or um, legislation or uh, a resolution that can ac accelerate into total lockdown or prohibits business, uh, at some point, it's going to diminish the returns. Um, people are doing very, very well right now, as is, from what I've seen. We've had anecdotes, but it's not the rule. Uh, Pinellas County is not San Francisco or New York. Our population density and means of transport do not spread disease in nearly the way theirs does. We're not Italy. We have four times the ICU capacity they do. Uh, putting in place 100% uh, restrictions is expedient politically. It doesn't apply to you guys. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, the essential... So, to Mayor Kreisman, his comments earlier, the essential businesses in Pinellas County are all businesses. Those are the means by which we eat. We currently are looking at government checks to supplant that income for now, but that's not gonna help long term, and that's also not going, there, there are gaps there. So I'd appreciate if you guys would consider putting in some kind of metrics to get in and out of it, mostly. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, John Bennett, did you wanna say anything? Good morning. Good morning, John. Actually, yeah, good morning, Commissioners. John Bennett, <laughs> Chief of Staff, City of Tampa. First, thanks for the invitation to come over today and work with the key partners across the Bay. I think we've heard uh, great discussions. Appreciate the efforts of County Administrator Barry Burton, obviously Sheriff Guadalajara, and Mayor Kreisman as we try and work uh, in this collaborative effort 
uh, across the bridge, if you will, to do the best thing for our citizens in our metropolitan statistical area. As you know, this is, you know, the regionalization factor is what Mayor Castor is concerned about. You know, we, um, you know that we're looking to be a more resilient community together. Uh, that's evident by some of the proactive measures that we've taken. So this gesture of, of trying to look at the language and keep the framework very similar to protect our communities and our citizens, not squeeze the balloon and push folks on each side of the bay is very critical. That's why she asked me to spend time with you over here this morning to make sure that message was, was clear that we support the efforts that Pinellas County and partners are doing. And we're going to follow suit um, to the best we can over across the bay in the city of Tampa. And we hope that uh, the other urbanized counties follow the same. You know, we know there's seven urbanized counties. You see three of them contiguous in South Florida, what they're going through. Uh, you see what we're going through is two contiguous urbanized counties that are, each county is, is bigger than some of the states in the nation. And so we have the density and the risk factors. Uh, the one thing we don't have, and I appreciate all the comments about the data, is we do have resting data. We know how many people uh, are being treated uh, because they have tested positive. And of course, we know the few fatalities that we're trying to avoid. But what we don't know is that 7 to 14 day data set that is putting us in increased risk. And I think as we move incrementally through this process, um, and I, I appreciate all the comments of paring the down, the, the, uh, the safer at home message, which is what we've been working on as well. Our plan is very well aligned with everything that has been said here. Uh, we're hoping that some of our key partners in our urban areas will do the same thing. And I just want to remind some of us that have been here for over 20 years doing this, we have a great foundation. The sheriff knows this as well as what we know in our public safety world. We have the Urban Area Security Initiative that's been around since just after 9-11. And it started out in three cities and two counties of, of you know, St. Pete, Clearwater, and Tampa, Pinellas, and Hillsborough County. And it brought us all together almost 20 years ago to do this very thing and align our resources, our strategies, and our tactics to protect the public from any natural or man-made disaster. We didn't expect a pandemic of this measure. We know we're fighting something that we can't see. Uh, but together, we can get through this. And I'm really here just to answer any questions specifically about what we're doing in Tampa and how Mayor Castor can support you over here in Pinellas. Yes, please. Um, John, thank you so much for being here. I'm most interested in it, uh, whether or not your actions in Hillsborough County, well, two things. Do your actions in Hillsborough, and not in Hillsborough County, in the city of Tampa, do they mirror what is in our resolution? Do they say resolution? Do they say order? Those two words are important, mm -hmm. as Commissioner Eggers has pointed out. And lastly, do you have in your ordinance resolution, whatever, the language that uh, Mayor Kreisman has talked about? Because I really believe it's so important for us to be consistent. Understand. Um, so let me answer the first question. Um, our draft, of course, you know, being in the county, we have to align ourselves with the county's um, emergency policy group or executive policy group, just like everybody does in each county. We're trying to take the, uh, the, the things that the state are doing and leverage those into our policies. We're doing the things, of course, in conjunction with Hillsborough County. But the mayor also feels that because we are in a densified area that we have to take additional actions. So we are very closely aligned. Our city attorney, Gina Grimes, has been working very close with the attorneys that were here today um, to get that alignment where it is. Um, how this ends up as far as when the mayor launches it at the end of the day, uh, there's an executive policy, emergency policy group convening today in Hillsborough at 1.30, and I'm sure more of this will be part of that agenda. But we're, uh, we're looking to build on the orders that are already existing, and whether it becomes a directive or an order is, uh, is to be finalized. Thank you. Now, as far as um, some of the nuance, uh, specifically, we're very concerned about small businesses. As we know, most businesses are small businesses. Uh, we also know that we can crawl, walk, run through this model, and we could keep moving just like it's been testified already. But one thing we do know is that because the data is 7 to 14 days behind the curve of knowledge, we have to take some calculated risks to make the community safer at home. 
And we have to trust and verify those businesses that they're going to do the right thing and they're going to adapt. I mean, they all open a business because they're entrepreneurial spirits already. We're hoping that they'll figure out a way to adapt. We've talked to our golf courses. We've set up those um, uh, navigation lines to help the small businesses stay afloat and recover and do everything that they need to do for their employees. So we're working, we're trying to work on a one-on-one -on -one model with each of those businesses. We know there's some businesses that just can't adapt because the environment doesn't create that. And that's where we're hoping the relief packages will come in. But in the meantime, you know, we've, we've modified our golf course behavior. We've modified our boat ramp behavior. We're trying to do everything we can to keep those small, small businesses, you know, paddling through this, if you will, to, to we can recover quicker. And I do agree with the statement that the, the reasonable measures we take today may sh not only flatten the curve, but it may shorten the economic challenges that we're all facing. So we're hoping by taking this immediate action now will be not only preventative, but faster recovery to the entire uh, region. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I have an ask. Sure. Uh, as, I, as, I, as I sit here and, and think about this and, and getting back to the enforcement and the messaging of this, is, is that, and there's always danger of doing this on the fly, but I'm going to do it anyway because I think that would be helpful and could help get the message out. As you make part of this directive, that uh, we prepare a notice. And the notice is part of it, it says, per the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners, consistent with the CDC guidelines. And we post it, and we could print it, and I could have deputies deliver it, just like we delivered all the hotels, and post it on the front door of every retail establishment. And yeah. they're required as part of this to post it. And then I could have deputies go out and we could touch everybody and post this and make them post it on the front door. And it would also help us because if we go there and people aren't adhering, we can say, look, here's, and it would help. So I'd suggest that we consider doing that and you consider that as part of this uh, resolution and make it mandatory that all these businesses that stay open post this type of a sign that's very clear and it says per the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners plus CDC guidance and we craft that and you consider making that part of this. I think that's a great idea. It is a great idea. Um, a great idea. Another thing I was thinking of, and I, I know I was on the losing end of the actual order, but I, I think maybe we can craft a way that businesses who actually can stay open and can, uh, because I think we're going to need more serious things next week when we come back, um, a way for them to prove that they're following the guidelines, that they can operate without having people within six feet of each other. And I'm not sure how we, how we do that, but I think maybe that's a way, if they're motivated enough to stay open, that they can provide some proof that they're doing that. Um, either like the woman was talking about the hair salon with the individual uh, rooms that they do it in but anyway that, that's just an idea mm -hmm. I think we're probably going to adopt this the way it is um, okay <laughs> and you had a motion yes madam chair I would move that we approve the resolution as drafted by the county administration along with the sheriff's posting requirements a second okay can, um, I make, can I make a statement yes you can all make statements uh, yeah. yes okay. go ahead commissioner um, well, just, you know, it was, um, appreciate the mo motion and the seconder, which I'm going to support. Um, just this list of things that we got from the first uh, speaker that uh, she didn't get a chance to go through. She was speaking about hair salons and spas. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was a couple of other things on there that just got my attention. And one of them was the shopping malls. Um, especially with regards, those are individual retailers, just like we talked about these other retailers. They're going to get those notices as well. But that food court where, again, keeping in mind that they're restaurants, they take the food and go versus take the food and sit congregating in, a, in, a, you know, in an area, I think is a, big, is a deal that we're trying to avoid. So I think that's something that we just need to perhaps think about as it relates to this because that's, that's a huge, I mean, the mall could be packed. And I think that whole, dis you know, that's the social distancing thing needs to be delivered to the owner of the mall and the shops. Um, and at the same time, tell the food courts it's not about congregating and eating. It's coming and taking your food. If you have a drive through which they don't, you could drive through and get it. But um, these, these, I think it needs to be incorporated somehow. 
just a just a thought. Right now, that's all I had. Uh, Commissioner Walsh. Uh, so that generated a question. So malls are still allowed to operate. I know Simon and some others have shut down. And, I, I think for the most part they've they've all uh, taken action, but there may be some. That's something we're going to have to look at. Okay. I, I don't know how they meet this, the CDC guidelines of social distancing, having in a mall type environment. But but again, that's something that we're going to have to look at as we implement this and see where there's issues. Well, I, um, Madam Chair, raised the issue about the social distancing provision uh, as a concern. Uh, turned my notifications off because, like you, my phone and iPad were blowing up with notifications. Yeah. But, you know, we're in a position of trying to make a decision on public health right now. We know we're in that one to two week cone. But I've been really moved by what I'm hearing and what I've heard over the last couple of days, as I know you have, for folks who are wondering if they're going to have anything in a recovery. Um, what's there after the storm for them. Uh, and I'm concerned that we don't take steps that just kill more jobs than we absolutely have to. Um, and we can't eliminate all the risks. That essential list, list of job of businesses is long. It's mm -hmm. extensive. Grocery stores, gas stations, you, we can't eliminate all the risks. Uh, inbound flights from New York. Um, I looked at the federal uh, coronavirus bill, um, just trying to understand what can folks look forward to in terms of putting food on the table. And in my quick read, it's fifteen hundred dollars for a single person, twenty four hundred for couples, five hundred for per child. That might last a family a month. Then, then what? Right. So I think this, with monitoring and compliance and enforcement, I think the notice is a very good idea. I think this is the best decision we can make right now. I know cities can go further if they want to. Um, it acts in a way that hopefully will flatten the curve, but then save as much of our economy as we can mm -hmm. for the recovery. Uh, so I'm going to support this today. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long? Yes, I just had one question because it was kind of left hanging there. Are we calling this a resolution or are we calling this an order? What are we doing with that language? It's I think it is a resolution. Does it matter, Jewel? Tell My us. recommendation is that this remain in the form of a resolution because legally that's the vehicle by which counties act. However, to be clear, your resolution has the force of law. Okay. If you would like, we could go through here and modify some of the language to include um, language that's a little bit more direct. For instance, we could title it COVID-19 Safer at Home Order. Um, we could also, in your opening paragraph where you say, we resolve a Safer at Home Declaration, we could call it a Safer at Home Order. And if that's the direction that you all would like for us to take, and really generally speaking, what I would like to request as long as I'm up here, um, I hear the motion would include the recommendation made by the sheriff. I would ask you all to take either as part of this motion or a second motion to allow the county attorney's office to work with county administration to um, modify this in a manner that reflects the discussion here today. So perhaps as a, as a second motion subsequent to the main motion that's currently pending. Okay. Are we talking... Scribner's what? corrections and what and we would be doing. We're not talking about policy shift. No, I, what I heard in your motion is that you wanted to include uh, the recommendation by the sheriff right. to require a posting. And, and if I can just read what I wrote down and, and see uh, if that's consistent, that we would have some form of notice that would set forth the requirements of the resolution. Uh, including that businesses that are functioning do so consistent with CDC guidelines. And then I believe I also heard, and confirm if this is accurate, that there be some sort of brief statement as to what that particular business is doing to conform to those guidelines. It would be a posting requirement for retail business. And what I would envision is it would be not much different than what you all have done in the past, for instance, in your wage theft ordinance where you require employers to post a notice of certain um, certain things enumerated in your ordinance. So we could very easily include that. We could model it after some language that you have uh, requiring posting in some other ordinances. But those are the three issues that I believe I heard. 
Um, I, I would also suggest that it say the notice say and maybe maybe okay delegate this to the administrator we can work with that it say on the notice that a violation is a violation of law. Yeah. If people are on notice. That and and if, so if, if you, you want, you else? could delegate to the administrator yeah. the ability to draft that notice. Yeah, yeah. I'm fine That's with what that. I, um, I think we need to have a place for them to contact if somebody walks in a store and they're obviously just paying no attention okay. to that at all. Who do they call? We would recommend. Well, I've heard of the sheriff, but we have <laughs> sheriff, our. Yeah. We, well, we have our, but we have our citizen but, information center. It's one okay. central number, and we can field it through there, and we can staff it appropriately. Okay, just I think they to need a consistent. place to, to go with that. All right, great. Madam Chair, as the motion, I would include the recommendations from the county attorney on that. I would second that. Um, okay. Well, I would second what he's. Is that a part of the original yes. motion? Yes. yes. Well, the commissioner Long seconded the. The oh, it is? It Peters. Was, okay. Peters. I'm sorry. Peters. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yes. Just, just a, uh, just a couple of comments, if I could, and um, um, some of the comments that uh, Commissioner Welch said, and you know, earlier Commissioner Justice said um, that you know, obviously, our our residents, our businesses are all hurting already, and we're trying. To, this this effort's been made to try to walk that line in partnership with our businesses. So um, I think the word somebody used that, was, that spoke here was about trust and you know, trusting our, our residents, trusting our businesses to get on board with the seriousness of this. And I think that's where we're heading with this kind of resolution slash directive slash order. So I, I mean, I think that's critically important. I do also think that somewhere down the line, and I, I said at the very beginning, we've had heard from a couple of people, tracking numbers and how that relates to ratcheting up or ratcheting down entering in this uh, we're going to be watching this carefully i mean mm. you know it's like oh my gosh the numbers are exploding or they're staying pretty level the, the 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 things that we're doing are working i mean it's going to be really important to figure out what we're following make sure we're all on the same page and our residents are on the same page um and uh again i would beg and ask all of our residents please on the recreation front be smart about it we're allowing boats to go out there. We're allowing people out in the in the parks, on the trails. Um, I'm sure there are some people that are walking along the beach front between the waterfront down there that are trying to just stay apart from each other. They're not congregating in the parks. They're not congregating on the beaches. They're doing the smart things that we've been asking them to do. Please keep doing that so that we don't have to do anything else with that. Um, and then the, the two final things I would say is um, that communication uh, met messaging I, I just I'm just urging you from my perspective to have a face that communicates with our residents daily on the challenges that we're going through of the day and the things that are going on that day um, maybe it's every other day whatever but I strongly think that communication piece is critical um, and then finally um, we've heard it from a couple people today about budgets about our budgets about our willingness to share in the pain um, and there's going to be some of those ramifications coming. Um, there's no doubt that we're going to get hit. We've already been hearing from people about property tax relief, uh, which that translates to less income. That translates to everybody kind of weighing in. I, I remember the last time, 10 years ago, this went through. We in Dunedin, we did a survey of our of our employees and said, "Do you want cuts or do you want get cuts in salary, so that we're all sharing in it, or do we want?" cuts in personnel and it was always cuts in salary so that we're all sharing in it a little bit i'm not saying that's the conversation for today but i do think there's met there's there's some uh, conversation that we're going to be having to have on that front i'm sure you guys are looking at that as well um but just you know we're we're, we're we need to be suffering too a little bit and i and i know we all are in many other ways but so just a thought and that's all i had thank you okay um we have a motion Sorry, Commissioner Long. I just have one comment that I would like to make to some of the comments that have been made here and the ones that we're getting on our email. For anyone to suggest that we are not taking this seriously, that we don't understand or not sharing in the pain is not only outrageous, it is personally offensive. I cannot tell you how deeply every one of us feel the actions that we are here sitting here today taking. 
I don't think any of us ever thought we'd be dealing with this kind of an unknown. And Madam Chair, before you close the meeting today, I would like Dr. Cho to come up and say one more time why this is nothing but the flu. We have thousands oh, of people that die, <laughs> and it's no different than the flu. That is making me nuts. So at some point, Madam Chair, for the sake of our public and the people that are listening, I think we need to say it again. We cannot say it enough. Thank you. Thank you. I was, I was going to say something similar. This is about a pandemic. Understand... I mean, I'm married to a former small business owner who lost his business in the last downturn. Um, we know. But we're trying to save your lives, too. So please try to understand that. And, you know, if you want to take a turn sitting up here, maybe <laughs> somebody might be willing to switch out with you because <laughs> I haven't slept in a week. Commissioner Seal. Well, I think um, everyone has expressed their thoughts very elo eloquently today, and I just want to again thank um, Barry, Jewel, and the sheriff, and all of our staff yes, please. most sincerely, because um, you are really making a difference in people's lives, and you're saving lives. And through all this hard work and dedication, we'll move the needle. So I just want to leave everybody today with saying, so as we go forth with this, we <clears throat> want to do it with grace, compassion, and kindness, and that that's what's going to turn the tide so that we can um, come back as United P Pinellas County. We do have a little bit of business to do after we take this vote, so don't go anywhere. Um, okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Justice, a second from Commissioner Peters. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's unanimous. Um, Okay. What do we Can need I to ask do for next? That motion to allow us to conform the language of yes, the resolution yes, yes. you had before you to the mm -hmm. discussion here. I, mean, I thought we had already done that. Yeah, we okay. did that already. I thought we included that in the yeah, motion. We did. I thought yeah, we did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I know there was other things we needed to do today. Go ahead. One other you. thing, which is um, uh, there was a change that allows you to um, have a meeting uh, remotely right. um, as part of. Uh, dealing with this pandemic and so um, we have been working and staff is here to talk about the process that we could use uh, we certainly didn't want to employ that for this meeting uh, but we could for future meetings if you chose to, to do that then we could have a meeting remotely if you want to do that what I would suggest is one I'll ask them to come up and explain that process to me and you <laughs> And, and then for you to go back to your offices and let's yeah. test it well, while we've yeah. got everybody here and IT st staff can help us with that. But the first thing I need to hear is that, that you're wanting to employ that technology. If you are, then we could take additional steps to see if it works to your satisfaction. Yeah, yeah as long as we have a, a way for public to There, there would be a way things. for a public to weigh in. But, but I first wanted to see if it's if, if you're even interested. And if you are, then I'll ask staff to come up and explain it. Um, can we do that after we end the meeting? Oh, yeah. We would, we would do okay. a practice afterwards. Then, there would go, be no business. We want to take then, a then you can actually kind of take feel it hands-on okay. and see if, if, if it meets okay. to your satisfaction. Okay, that works. Dr. Chow, don't forget Dr. Chow. Anybody else for right now? Dr. Cho, remind us one more time why we're here. I'm sorry, but yeah. I'd be happy to reiterate that uh, some of the messaging, I, I love the discussion here. Uh, I can't envy the position you have as policymakers and decision makers. Um, but this is serious. Uh, this is novel. We've never seen anything like this again since 1918. Um, I like what Kathy said in one of our first meetings, that uh, it's a time to be kind. and. Think of others because um, some of the things and some of the social distancing uh, measures that you do for yourself could be saving somebody else that's vulnerable um, that can develop these severe complications. So again and again, uh, let's do that personal 
uh, protective measures. Stay home when you're sick. Wash your hands. Um, co uh, cough into your elbow. Um, and, and practice that social distancing. Uh, no more than 10 people um, in a gathering uh, six feet apart. So I appreciate uh, the time and the opportunity to reiterate that message. I just want to say I read a great article yesterday, and I wish I could remember. I might have saved it on my phone. I'll send it to you all. From a person who was um, immunosuppressed, like our friend John Maroney was, when they, they, she had just gone through a, a stem cell transplant and talked about how she went through that, and it was exactly the same thing. Wash your hands. Stay away from other people. You know, wipe down surfaces and do it way more than you think you should or that you need to because otherwise you're dead you know okay. and this is this is that serious so if i can find it again i'll send it to you um, thank, you. thank you thank you dr Chuck. thank you thank you doctor um okay i guess we're adjourned for right well, now are we are you wanting to come um, yeah oh i'm sorry i'd like to hear it yeah yeah let's try it yes. let's try, let's give and, it a shot and can i make a suggestion that if it doesn't work that we take wellman because that's plenty of space that everyone could have a table and there's rooms outside that people could gather in groups of 10 that that would be a good solution if this doesn't Sorry, work. say that again move the place to, move the location if, if right, technology location. does not work that we move to lelman because lelman right, has right. the facility that can manage this as long as we took all the art the equipment and could hook it up there and leave it for a while. Just a suggestion. We could do yeah, that. that is a good room, Come but on, it's a lot of setup and takedown if we don't have so to. So I'll let them explain the technology for a minute. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. Good Brian morning. Zomalt, Office morning. of Technology Innovation. Jeff Rohr is our CIO. Um, we've been working the last week uh, between BTS, OTI, Marketing Communications, and Legal <clears throat> to come up with a process for you guys to run a board meeting remotely. Um, we have a, a webinar style uh, remote solution that we can use to do that. Uh, it would cover all the statutory requirements for a board meeting. Um, and we believe that we at least want to try it uh, for the next meeting and maybe test it out today with you before you leave uh, to see that it's going to meet everybody's needs for, for a board meeting. Uh, can I ask? Oh. Yes, go ahead. So this runs on a Mac, right? No, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> well, yes, on your iPad. All platforms. We all we all have okay. So we all have individual no. laptops. Not on the iPad. Not on the iPad. No. Oh. Oh. Talking oh. laptops. Correct. Okay. Uh, well, we only have I would like to separate that into um, a couple. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Groupings. Maybe we can, but let's do this after yeah. we take a break. Well, just, we can adjourn the meeting and just because. We're gonna get There's going to be lots of questions. Okay. Well, right. I just want to understand the format. Can we do it from our own computers? Or are you issuing laptops? So for for the commissioners, we envisioned issuing you laptops specifically for that, which would free up your iPads and other devices for viewing documents. So you're not using the same device to do both. Uh, okay. For the for the oh, okay. public yeah, participation, I just sense. wanted to make a quick statement on that. On the public participation <coughs> side, we would envision using both a telephonic option, telephone, and a technology option as well. So we would satisfy folks that don't have the technology necessarily to do it. Is this video as well? It, it, it would be video. See each other? Absolutely. Okay. Just like we've done the town halls, basically. Yeah. yeah. Very similar. Yeah. Question, uh, and, I, and I, I, I was asked yesterday, and I just had been remiss to bring it up, and I see a young lady over in the audience uh, signing. So uh, the deaf community has expressed some concerns about not being able to get the messaging because we're not scrolling anything and we're not signing what we're talking about. So I think that's something that we real. I'm, I'm just saying we got to, you know, it's a group of folks in our in our community that we need to at least think through. So, so just one of the strategies, we will actually broadcast the webinar in that will actually include the closed captioning for the public. So that okay. should oh, okay. be covered the okay. way we do any other board. Great, meeting. great, great. Okay, we are adjourned for now. We're gonna. We're, I don't want to go in there. It's wow. kind of close. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do it out here. Can we come back here in just a few minutes? And with your with your laptop. With our lap Okay, so laps. staff would come up. We'll come back, reconvene back in here. It's not a public meeting, and just okay. we'll work on this Cheap. topic. Did they come in here or in their offices? Uh, oh, it, did you want to do it from our office? We're going to bring staff to your offices if that's okay. Okay, okay fine. That system. works. And what time do you want to do this? Quarter of. Quarter of. Okay. Great.